<laughs> All right, welcome to the Code Searcher class. Today we got with us Troy Miller, who's going to be talking with us about the calendar and uh, the Moedim, and uh, you know get, we're going to pick his brain on some some questions. A lot of questions that go around. We finally got Troy with us that we'll be able to ask those questions. Um, I'm really excited about this because we're seeing more and more people come to the calendar of the most high you guy and i know it's a very confusing thing for many people i see basically about four or five camps of the the hebrews that were kind of spread out and we're not quite on the same page but you guys that's coming you who is going to get us synchronized it's not going to be man that does it um all we seem can to be able to do is cause division and strife when we get into it you who is going to do it but the way to it and to open the eyes of those is putting out, you know, solid information with, with being able to prove what you're saying. Scripture, I believe, Scripture proves the 8, 15, 22, 29. Uh, we have found seven months in the Scripture where the Scripture indicates that, that those are the days, Right. But yet I have to contend with some who will like to take from Jubilees or from Enoch. A couple of passages from there to debunk what the Bible says. And, and this is not real good hermeneutics, you guys. We have to overcome that. We can't take a book that contradicts the Bible and prove the Bible wrong. Uh, this would be like me taking the Talmud and proving the New Testament is wrong because of what the Talmud says. You guys, it doesn't fit and doesn't go together. That's not how hermeneutics work, okay? So um, with that being said, welcome, Troy. Um, it's glad to have you here, brother. Finally, be able to catch up with you um, and talk about the calendar. Indeed. All right, so um, let's start with how did you come to the knowledge of, you know, the Shabbat not being Saturday. I know you come from a Seventh Day Adventist um, background, and let me just say, you guys, the Seventh Day Adventist not only did have salvation right because all of the Protestants and Catholics we all have that salvation message. Very simple: believe, have faith in Him, have faith He rose from the dead, and you're saved. The thief on the cross didn't go through catechism to be saved, right? It's very simple. So they got the salvation message, but also the Shabbat before anybody else and so they were on to something with this right so knowing that that you have this seventh day adventist what got you looking into wait a minute uh, we're, we're trying to keep the sabbath but we don't exactly have it right i will try to keep it to a minimum it's okay. actually several interesting bunny trails that i could go down i have no idea how long your class typically lasts but I'll try to uh, keep everything as brief as I can. Um, we'll be good, Troy. We usually go two or three hours, so you're, you're oh. <laughs> good. <laughs> not, not a problem then. Yeah, yeah we're good. <clears throat> um, I am a fourth generation Seventh Day Adventist. <clears throat> we moved from Florida to Missouri in 1998. And <clears throat> um, after we moved here, uh, there was a couple here in Missouri, they were Adventists, but they had discovered the feasts, I don't know how long ago, many years ago, and because they observed the feasts, and they knew the Father's, well, their version of the Father's name, um, <clears throat> they couldn't be a member in any church, so they, there was like 24, 26, I forgot the number now, um, Adventist churches in the immediate area within like a two-hour range or something, and they would go from church each each Sabbath. They had a schedule, and they would just go to this church and that church and this church because they, well, they couldn't wear out their welcome, or they they were not welcome in any one given place. So they just didn't wear out their welcome in any of those places. Well, they lived thirty miles away from us, and they, I guess, we invited them home for after you know Sabbath, whatever after church, something we saw them in there, and so we made acquaintance with them. Well, it just so happened that the church that I was a member of, they had, they were, they shared a pastor with like three different churches. So he could only be there once every three weeks. 
So I was, I don't remember what office I held in the church, but anyway, they asked me if I would be willing to speak. And I said, sure. And it just so happened that that couple was in the audience at the time. And I was reading a passage and I think it was Exodus 3, 13, where the father was giving his name, you know, um, uh, Moses was saying, well, who do I tell him sent you, sent me? And I read, I am that I am. And of course, at the time, the only understanding I had of the name was Yahweh. So I looked up the audience and I said, I think this is Yahweh here. And I continued right back. Well, I didn't see the response that this couple had. The, the woman just about fell out of her chair because I, this was something that they believed that the father had a name and it wasn't God or Lord or Jesus or anything like that. So I spoke this from the pulpit and they had never heard. Well, like I said, it's a wrong sacred name, but it was somebody's version of it. Right. The sacred name from an Adventist pulpit. And they absolutely came unglued. Well, then they were like, oh, you know, Troy's right for the picking. You know, so they kind of became friends with my family. And uh, they said, you know, what do you think about the feasts? And what do you think about the statutes? And, you know, so they started hitting me with this. Well, uh, some friends of ours that also moved from Florida with us, they did adopt the, the statutes and the feasts. They'd only been Adventists for like five years. So they didn't have all the baggage I had. And so they had. So then they kind of teamed up <laughs> and they were praying for us and all kinds of things. I didn't know this at the time, but they were just, Troy and Bethany just have to see this. So anyway, they, they finally said, I finally, I got tired of them hounding us, I guess. So I said, okay, you guys pick one of you to come over to the house and I'll sit at your feet and I will listen to what you have to say. Cause I was kind of holding them at arm's length because I always give them an Adventist answer for everything they threw at me. So they selected one and they were all, I didn't know, this is all, I found this all out later. They were all at one person's house and they were fasting and praying <laughs> the whole time. And so the, their ambassador came and I sat at her feet, literally, and I listened and I was listening to all the little words she was using, you know, like uh, Jewish economy and day of atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles. And she was, you know, just you know, different things. And of course they were presenting from Ellen White and the scripture and everything else. And so I said, okay, thank you very much. When she was done, she went home and I got six hours sleep in the next 72 hours. Wow. I was up all night. On long. fire, huh? I was, well, it wasn't on fire. Well, I, I was, but for the wrong reason. I was going to prove them wrong. I was using all her words. Remember those words I was logging? Yeah. You know, yeah. Kind of keeping track of what you were saying. So I'm going to, and I had a search engine on my computer at the time. I had all, everything that Ellen White wrote, everything that was published during her lifetime was on one CD. Of course, I had scripture. There was a King James on the same CD. This was back in 1999, I'm guessing. And so I'm looking, putting all those little code words that she was using, if you will, into my search engine. And I looked exhaustively every place in, in Ellen White's writings, everything in scripture. And I was trying to prove them wrong. That's what I was on fire for. And I found some passages that seemed to prove my point. But for everything I found that proved my point, I found 10 that proved their point. And so it was like, okay. I mean, you, you've heard of the old cliche, if you can't beat them, join them. That's basically what happened. And of course, you know, I, I was- wish that would happen to more researchers that are out there, brother. But, but I, I really believe that they don't go no further than you telling them, oh, this is this, is this and this is that. Here's the information. Yeah. Go study it for yourself. They don't go no further than that. Right. I believe it. <clears throat> they can come to the same conclusion because that's what happened right. to me. And, you know, Yahuwah can use that uh, that fire either way. You know, what was intended for evil, he'll turn for good. But you were intended on, you know, debunking these evil. guys. And Yahuwah used that momentum to change well, you. Yeah. Because, because I was so motivated to prove them wrong. I mean, that's, you know, pulling the slingshot back. I would just keep motivated, motivated, motivated. Well, now all this energy is right here. And guess what? At that point, that energy had to go someplace. I couldn't shoot it at him and saying, you were wrong. It's like, oops. You know, it's like a boomerang. You know, I had to throw the boomerang. It came back and whacked me up the head <laughs> because I found that I was wrong, you know. So, and again, I spoke with spiritual integrity earlier. This is before I had published anything. I had, I, I hated public speaking at that, at this point. I mean, I was terrified. Me to too. do anything publicly. Yeah. And so uh, this was basically my baptism by fire, if you will, where 
I found out that I was wrong. I had found out that the Adventist church had lied to me my entire life. I found out that everything that I thought, well, not everything I thought, but most everything that I thought was true was either a lie or a half truth. And I had to start from ground zero. I literally, now some people get completely destroyed. They lose their faith when they have this epiphany. They're like, oh, I can't believe anything now. Right. Like, no, no, you still have scripture. You still have the truth. It's just not what you thought it was. You know, so it, I mean, I never had that moment where I was groundless or didn't have an anchor. Um, I didn't have a church or suddenly because now it's like, uh, I can't trust anything they said, you know, but I still had scripture. I didn't lose that. So at that point, um, I mean, we were in short order. I think it was like three months after we started keeping the feast and understanding the, the right use of the father's name, uh, the sacred name, that uh, we were basically disfellowshipped. So it was shortly after this disfellowshipment that we were walking up the hill from my house to see the crescent moon for the seventh month. This, I mean, it was um, tabernacle, uh, trumpets, feast of trumpets. trumpets. Yeah. And of course, my understanding of new moon at that time was the Jewish version. I mean, the, the, the couple that went from church to church to church, they were very much into the Hebrew roots movement. So the, as, as far as they studied was just basically what the Jews said, but it was enough to get me started on uh, this journey so because they yanked the rug out from my Adventist rug they yanked it out from under my feet that left me you know you know dangling and trying to catch some furniture to keep from falling but anyway right. we were this is how we got on the lunar sabbath that I had to tell you that story to get to this point we were walking up the hill and on the way up there my wife said well Troy she said Leviticus 23 says that the feasts are basically still binding we know that they're regulated by the moon it also says that the sabbath is the first feast and she said so why don't we keep the sabbath by the moon so i said well i gave her this long adventist answer <laughs> I'll, yeah. I, I'll try to paraphrase it here but i said well i said <clears throat> the you know the jews have never lost sight of the sabbath and and you know blah 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 the create uh, the crucifixion you know friday saturday sunday blah, blah, blah. i mean just a long hairy thing and she, my wife never said a word she did not respond. So you basically I mean, no, heard the same things that we hear. Oh, oh my, yeah, others. absolutely. Yeah, well, yeah, probably word for word, same arguments. Because yeah. I've, I've since I don't know if anybody's read the hall, my hall of shame, on the website, but I get the same arguments all the time. Yeah, They're, they never come up with anything new. It's always regurgitate the same. I see know, the same thing. Said. I call it parody. It's like a parrot. Yeah. Just re, th yeah. this guy repeats the same thing that guy was repeating, and, yeah. and neither have gone and searched it out themselves. Yeah. Because if yeah. they did, they would have this epiphany, guys. Yahuwah yeah. would, would meet you there and be like, ta-da, here's well, the... It, spiritual integrity. Yeah. If they have spiritual integrity, they will have that epiphany you spoke of. Yeah. But if they don't, if their heart's not ready for it, they'll make yeah. excuses, they'll backpedal, they'll dig in their heels. Yeah. Or they'll be it's ready to fight one of, the, yeah. one of the four. Wow. But anyway, that challenge, the gauntlet was laid. Um, she, I, like I said, I wish I could remember all the other arguments that I threw at her, but it was like 30 seconds worth of just various, this, 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 and this, you know, and that all proves that Saturday's the Sabbath, you know, and because she never said a word, um, I knew that something was wrong. Um, and my wife, she, she can't tell you chapter and verse. She can't tell you almost anything that I'll be sharing with you today. She wouldn't, may not be able to answer the way that I would answer it but she intuitively gets things without having the foundation, without seeing it in scripture. She intuitively just understands. And she's a firstborn. I'm a firstborn in our families. And the, typically the firstborns are the trailblazers, you know, so they we're the ones that kind of go out and we're not sure what we're doing, but we're, we're, we're going to figure it out on the way type of thing. Well, we were absolutely made for each other. She, she, you know, challenges me in ways uh, without fighting. She challenges me and pushes my buttons and I had to go and I looked at every one of my arguments that I used when I answered that question and I found out that every one of them was a lie. Every stinking one of them was a falsehood. And I'm like, oh no, it was that moment. It's like, oh no, the Sabbath is by the moon. Yeah. And even though I had not seen 8, 15, 22, 25, I didn't have any of the things about new moon, how it regulates and the, interrupts the weeks. And I mean, I didn't know any of that. I, at that moment, I knew it was true that the Sabbath was regulated by the moon. I just didn't know how. Yeah. And yeah. I didn't know how to prove it. 
but I knew that it was based on Leviticus 23. You know, he lists, he said for twice, he calls the Sabbath his first feast <laughs> and using the word, the word Moedim. And then he goes on and calls, of course, it's all feast, 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 Moedim, 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 all the way about the other ones. And then you go up to Genesis <coughs> and Psalms and you find out that the lights in the heavens regulate the Moedim. It's like, hello. You know, it doesn't say which. Well, Genesis doesn't say which. It just says one of the two great lights, the greater light or the lesser light. One of them regulates the Moedim. Yeah. You go to Psalms and you find out it's the moon that regulates the Moedim. So, you know, once I found those three verses, I was done. And the way that happened is we were, we had been kicked out of the church, the Adventist church. So we were keeping Saturday, quote unquote, at home. We were worshiping because there were three families that were kicked out at the same time for all keeping the feast. And so... Now there are I think Adventists, you were kicked out, but I believe you who have pulled you out of there as well. Yeah, yeah ultimately it was. Uh, that's what it was. But I mean, we did get dispelled. I would have still, I would have been happy to stay there because I didn't know any better. I've been happy to stay there. And we were accused of all man. They didn't even follow the church manual to kick us out. It was illegal. If I'd have wanted to, I could have, you know, remained in the church and they kind of undid what they did because right. they didn't follow the manual to do it. But anyway, um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm recovering from either the bad flu or COVID, I don't know which. So I'm trying to catch my cough with the mic, but sometimes I miss. But anyway, um, <clears throat> we were worshiping on Saturday at home and a blind man uh, that I, he was a native of here. I didn't know him before I moved here. He somehow found his way to my home. We were to, into my company and he was worshiping with us. And he listened, to, he, because he was blind, he couldn't read. So he'd listen to radio or he'd listen to tapes on, on cassette or CD, books on cassette or CD. And he was listening to shortwave radio. And he heard a man named Arnold Bowen, maybe you are familiar with him, some of them. And he was talking about this lunar Sabbath on shortwave. So he said, Troy, can I bring my radio? And can we, because it's every Saturday, he has this message. And I said, sure. So we rigged up a you know makeshift you know, wire uh, antenna in my yard. And we all sat out there around a picnic table and we listened to him. And he, of course, he gave his phone number and email address, whatever, at the end of it. And I called him and I got his booklet that he was offering. And he was talking, I don't remember if he was saying 8, 15, 22, 29 or not, but he was talking about, well, he talked about Genesis, the three verses I mentioned, you know, Genesis 114, uh, Leviticus 23, one through three and Psalm, um, one, oh, was it one nine, 109? What is the Psalm one? <laughs> Suddenly I have a blank. 104.19. Thank you, 104.19. Yeah. So anyway, he had those three verses in it and a few others. And it was enough to start me, jumpstart me on that journey. At that point, okay, now I can prove it from scripture. That is how I got to, that was the beginning. And that was in 2002 or I think 2002. And 2003, I was, yeah, about 2002, 2003 is the beginning of this journey. Wow. So what, so what, at what point did you realize that not only are we looking for the sliver in the seventh month, but we're actually supposed to be doing that every month. Sure. Right? Did you ever have that, that, that revelation? <laughs> it's like, Oh my gosh. <clears throat> actually I missed a part about how this gentleman, the blind fella came to my home. I missed a part uh, in that story. And I, yes, I actually do have a response to that. Um, we, once we started keeping the feasts, we discovered, oh, well, they're regulated by the moon. And new moon has something to do with these lunar months. And we, as Adventists, I mean, we were very familiar with Isaiah 66, 22 and 23 from, you know, new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come and worship for me. So we knew that new moon was something to be reckoned with. We just didn't know anything about it. Of course, we were baby feast keepers at the time. Now, so what did for, you now what what did you think of New Moon at, at that point? Just from a meteorology uh, a meteorology perspective, were you full moon or no moon at that point? Because that's was, this is a, the first obstacle people get to. Yeah, when they yeah, try to reconcile. Well, what is New Moon? It right? is this. This was this was the beginning of that struggle. Yeah, and we didn't know what New Moon was. Well, our friends this the hebrew couple or hebrew roots movement couple they are of course all about judaism so they were saying it's the first visible crescent you know announces the next day as new moon so that's kind of where we landed when we first started but the point was is we didn't know anything about new moon so for three entire months every sabbath there were one two three other couples worshiping with our 
in our home. We had, so we had our four families combined worshiping. And for three months, we studied about new moon and nothing but new moon. We were immersing ourselves in the concept of new moon, learning about it. Every place in scripture where it mentions new moon, which isn't very many, but we studied and looked and looked and studied. We looked in the Strong's, we looked in Hebrew interlinear. I mean, we were looking all over the place, trying to find any evidence about, you know, what exactly was new moon. It was in the process of studying the new moon that we realized that was what prompted my wife to ask the question going up the hill about why don't we keep the Sabbath by the moon? So it was the study of new moon that was what prompted the Sabbath by the moon thing. And a friend of ours, <laughs> during this three month period, a friend called my wife and said, hey, um, what are you guys studying? And my wife was kind of hesitant because this other woman was still in the Adventist church. And she said, my wife turned on her. She said, well, what are you studying? And this other lady said, well, we're studying new moon. <laughs> My wife said, good, you keep studying. Tell us what you find. Click and hung up. The blind man that I was telling you about. Now, remember, when he says he's reading a book, he's actually listening to a tape or a CD. Right. So he was he said, I was reading scripture is what he said. He was reading scripture to his daughter. He had like a nine year old daughter at the time. And every night he would read scripture while it was playing a tape. And he said, I don't know what the deal is, because he came to, to our home and we were studying New Moon. He, and finally, he interjected. He says, I don't know how to tell you this, but I've been studying, you know, reading scripture, meaning listening to a tape. And almost every tape or CD, I don't remember if it was cassette or CD, but anyway, everyone he played talked about New Moon. And that had been going on for weeks with his daughter. He said, you're not going to believe this, but this has been going at his house. You know, so there were three of us in the same area. He was in Rolla, I were in Salem, and this other couple was in Ava, Missouri. And we were all three studying New Moon at the same time, and we all came to the same conclusion. Jeff, the, the fellow who was blind, he listened to the shortwave, found Arnold Bowen, who was saying, oh, yeah, the Sabbath's by the moon. So Jeff discovered that. My wife challenged me going up the hill about, you know, why don't we keep the Sabbath by the new moon? I'm going, <gasps> and this other lady, she called. I finally, she came and joined us for one Sabbath. She was like two hours away, so she couldn't come every week. But this other lady from Ava, Missouri came and she's like all excited because, you know, we found, we came to the same conclusion. The Sabbath was by the moon. So that what's prompted it was the study of a new moon. Now we never, dis never found out what new moon was during, I mean, the actual new moon, because we were studying, you know, conjunction and first visible crescent and full moon didn't even, never entered our mind. Uh, mm -hmm. That was, that was something I think that the adversary has thrown out there. And I'm sorry if there's any of you full mooners that are listening not right here. now, but. No, uh, no, well, not, maybe, maybe on you, on YouTube, you're correct about that, but not here okay. in this class. And you're okay. right. It is the enemy that likes to throw. It, that I think the middle. enemy, because nobody on the, on this earth, ever thought that the full moon was new moon until all of a sudden this end of earth's history we start trying to keep the sabbath by the moon because i don't think anybody ever thought that at all yeah you know because the jews you can't kept find first... it you can't find right. it i've looked no. and there's no. nobody ever that thought the full moon was the new no. moon ever in history yeah so i believe that this is just a, a bunny trail to get people sidetracked and it's it's one of the weakest arguments that I've ever, my phone's ringing. I'm trying to turn it off here. Sorry. I thought I turned the ringer completely down a minute ago, but apparently I didn't. Anyway. It's a weak argument, but it's weak. the enemy uses that as, as a stronghold with, with some people that they're convinced it's the, it's the full moon, which it doesn't make put, any sense to me. No, if you put this on YouTube, and even if you don't, I want to offer, I've got two studies that I've put together that debunks the new moon versus full moon issue. Um, the full moon issue, I guess I should say. And I use scripture and history and nature, which is, you know, I always tell people that I, everything I prove or everything I believe I can prove scripturally, historically, or the, from the natural record from nature. And that, that this study is, there's no, my opinion is nowhere found in there. It's only though from those three sources. Right. And so if you would like those studies i'll be happy to email them to you if you Absolutely, want to sure. if yeah. you want to tell if you want to tell jonathan that you're interested and he can forward me your emails or something however you want to do it i'll be very happy to send those to you because you may be struggling with some friends that you know with this full moon thing and it'll completely yank just like i had my adventist rug yanked out from under me this will completely yank 
the rug out of any full moon believer that's out there. I'll make sure I'll have contact information and stuff like that in the description. So when they see okay. it, they can find you on there. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you want me to say what my email address is on, so it's recorded here that way. Sure, yeah, on, you can do that. On, you, on YouTube, then somebody may, you know, contact me and ask for it. I don't know. Um, is that okay? You want me Absolutely, to do that? Absolutely, sure. Yeah, okay. My email address is admin, A D M I N, at creationcalendar.com. Pretty simple. So, yeah, if you well, have and, any. And now that you say that, and this always got under my skin, now somebody come right behind you and created a calendar um, website with such a close. Yeah. yeah, they did. Just so they could. To yeah. Do that, you know, crescent moon, full moon thing. Oh, yeah. really? well, here you go. And it's just more confusion because you've got people that inadvertently go there because they're looking for you. Yeah. And this has happened, Troy. I've had people going, what well, Troy's thing is saying. I'm like, that's not Troy. That's not <laughs> yeah. Troy, brother. That's not Troy. And they're like, yeah, it's what you said. I was like, no, look, here's his, here's theirs. And when we're looking at it side by side, it's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. The enemy likes I to come and mimic and look like. I will yeah. I would like to tell you a story about that, how that all came about. I, I'd never met the lady who's the owner of that website. She was, or maybe I did, I can't remember. I was invited out to Washington State um, now to do some presentations on the Lunar Sabbath out there. And I went, uh, I talked to a pastor. I went to a meeting of, of Hebrew Roots Movement. I mean, he had me do several of them. And I may have met her there. I don't remember. But anyway, I think that's how she found out about me. And so she had my, I can't remember if she had called me on the phone or if she emailed me. And she actually called and asked me if she could use that title for her website. Oh, my gosh. And now at the time, she didn't believe the full moon was the new moon. Or if she did, it was not. I mean, put it this way. That doctrine didn't come out until several years later after she created that website. So I assumed she was on the same page as i mean i figured she might have some different you know beliefs but it's okay i mean okay so the people would at least try and find one of us you know so i thought that might not be a terrible idea so i gave her my you know gave her the thumbs up go ahead and then for her to do that um to come up with that full moon and i that's the reason why those two studies that i told you about that undoes the full moon thing that's the reason why those two studies came out it was in yeah. direct direct response to that garbage that was coming off that website the enemy is so cunning how he'll use yeah you know man to to do and i am the to i'm the i'm the most i'm the most unassuming um naive person you'll ever meet i mean i will always give you the benefit of the doubt i will always assume that you know what you're doing and you're not trying to hurt me that's and it's as for a grown man you yeah. think that's pretty dangerous but I'm talking spiritually is, I mean, I give everybody the benefit of the doubt spiritually. And, you know, I, I, I have a concealed carry. So, I mean, I don't trust everybody, you know, so uh, when I'm going out and about town, I may very well be armed, but the point is, is spiritually, I give everybody the benefit of the doubt and that, that came back to bite me in the butt. It did. Yeah. I've had uh, happen learn. things happen to me uh, too, too naive and uh, mm -hmm. trusting and, you know, mm -hmm. so, but you know, it, you was, and everything he teaches me something so i learned from that how to be more discerning how to how to look a little more detailed into what's actually going on you know i would get hacked troy i've been hacked like seven or eight times and where, oh where somebody will send me like a link and i'll click on it and then you know my computer's destroyed and it's always right. about the codes or the message right. and stuff like that well i got right. i learned from that i learned you know <coughs> these barriers around me you know, right. these, these barriers that have to be breached to, to get to me in that kind of way, because I was the benefit of the doubt. If you right. were talking to me, I would talk back. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I didn't, my first thought was this person is trying to do something to harm me. Right. But now, you know, I, I, I've learned to look for that first to look at, is right. this friend or foe? Yeah. Who am I talking to here? And how long yeah. have I known them? Because I've even had them get to know me for months just so that they can get close to me and pull a grenade and, and mm. detonate a grenade. I mean, I'm speaking <laughs> metaphorically here. Right. But, but, you know, it, it reminded me of suicide bombers when it happened, that they mm. get so close to you and then mm. pull a pin, right? That's what it kind of felt like, that, that guy. Oh, anyway, um, 
we've learned from those kinds of things. And, yeah. uh, and you know, yeah. you can't. I'm be still, I'm still too naive and trusting. I mean, although I, I have my skin, I think is a little thicker at this point. I, to, I mean, somebody will ask me a question in an email or something. And it was one of those controversial topics. And I figure, okay, they're, they're looking for a reason to throw a grenade. And yeah. uh, so now rather than immediately answer, because I don't know them from Adam, now I'll ask them a few questions first, try to pick their brain, find out why it is they want to know the answer to this question, you know, try to figure it out. And right. there's some times that I will answer at a later date. And other times I won't, because I know they're just looking to fight. So right. You live and you learn. That's right. Exactly right. Yeah. So, um, so, so where do we go from there? You, so now you, you've, you know, you're, you're doing all this study. Um, you're seeing things that you, you, you're, you're, you're letting go of false doctrines. Yeah. I know for me that it was quite the, the emotional and psychological ride. It was like a roller coaster. It was like, oh my gosh, it, 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 you know, and it was started with preacher of rapture dispensationalism, but it kind of cascaded from there because I kept finding all of these falsehoods everywhere. And, you know, I was getting a little angry, right? Not, not like rage, but like angry that I had righteous indignation. Rich. Yeah. And, and then I thought about it on the grand scheme of things. Wow. We have all been, we have all been duped on a lot. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. this is why it's important that, that each of us go for themselves. We, don't take it for granted. Get some resources, get a Bible out and start looking at scriptures yourself and stop repeating what your, you know, right. your mentor or your teacher is telling you and go search right. that thing out because I found the same thing. I found it's not exactly what they say. Yeah. Well, that was the reason why I, was, I, I mean, I was, I didn't like being cast out of the Adventist church, but after it was done, it was the greatest gift I, that has ever the church has ever given me is my freedom because then rather than studying what they wanted we were, we were free to study as the spirit moved and so it was a spirit that planted that new moon seed i'm absolutely certain i and, can, absolutely because i yeah. tell my students troy that when the holy spirit moves what mm -hmm. you will see mm -hmm. you won't see contradiction mm -mm. i just told them no. this not too long ago you get confirmation you get confirmation you get confirmation what they're saying over here and doing and over there mm -hmm. is matching to this that's yeah. when you know the Holy Spirit is doing something, you guys. I just told you guys that not too long ago. Remember that? That's when you know that that's it's not when, you know, well, the Holy Spirit told me this and the Holy Spirit told me that. And it's contradicting. You will never come. <coughs> and this is why no. it's misunderstood. The Torah is good. The Torah is bad. No, he's not bipolar. He's not contradicting. He's, <laughs> it is content. What is he talking about? He's talking about Torah. And he's talking about Talmud. The, the translators never make the distinction. They just let it say law. And so it looks like Paul's crazy when he says law is good, law is bad. Right? Right. You gotta yeah, get it's, it out. yeah, there's, like I said earlier, the, you know, getting kicked out of the church was a, a wonderful thing simply because it was at that point that I started to learn that just about everything that they had ever taught me was either half truth or a lie. And so it was that point where this, that term spiritual integrity uh, was kind of planted in my head to where I realized that because when I first started studying the feast, I started telling everybody back home, all my Adventist friends and family back home about what I was finding. And of course, I was filtering everything through my Adventist doctrine. And I was teaching the wrong new moon. I was teaching the wrong name. I was just all kinds of things that I was misinterpreting. It was kind of correct is one step removed from the lie that I had been told, but it wasn't the full truth. And at that point, the spirit, I learned that term spiritual integrity, and I stopped saying or producing anything. Nothing came out of my mouth. Nothing was mailed to anybody. Nothing went on the internet. No study was offered to anybody else unless I could prove from scripture, from historical record, or from nature that what I was saying was true. I stopped offering my opinion to anybody for any reason, because if there's Troy Miller in it, it was had to go, had to go away. And I'll tell you two little games that the father started playing with me. And I say games because it's kind of humorous. OK, <laughs> I'll just say it that way. But if you'll read my studies. You'll see that there is a period, an exclamation point or a question mark at the bottom of every page. 
There's never, not one page in the hundreds, maybe thousands of pages of studies that I put out that in that there one sentence will begin on the one page and you have to turn it over to finish the sentence. It always ends with a, punct a punctuation point, every page. And that was kind of a, a handshake agreement I had with the Heavenly Father because I kept saying, I would read something that I was uncomfortable with it. I'd like, man, I don't know if I want to say it that way. That, that's just, you know, that's too much Troy or too, uh, my opinion, I'm afraid that that's going to be misunderstood, misinterpreted, or I've been too long winded, whatever the case might be. And so I'd say, you know, Father, help me figure this out. So I would edit it and I'd, or drag and drop, I'd put a uh, paragraph or a sentence in, I'd move it, I'd rearrange it to get, so it flowed better. And when it was done, there was a period or an exclamation point or a question mark at the end, bottom of the page. And I thought, well, that's curious. And I have literally done this. I'd have an eight or nine, 10 page study going and I would be uncomfortable with something that was on page seven, let's say. <clears throat> And I would drag something out, I'd put it on a different page or I'd eliminate it altogether, or I'd edit something and I'd be, I'd be done It's okay, now I'm happy. And I'd go back and every page above it ended with a punctuation point, every single page. And I, that's when I had this epiphany. Ah, the father's trying to tell me when, so I will know when all the Troy is out of it, it will end with a punctuation point at the end of each page. Now, I'm not saying that you guys have to do this, but this is how the father taught me how to get all the Troy and all my opinion and all the any controversial or any uh, too went long winded or too whatever to get it out of there. So it was I mean, I still have it's still too long winded. I still think I'm verbose because, you know, why can't I say it in three pages? Why is it 17? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. But every page will end with a punctuation. So that's one of the ways that the father taught me how to get Troy Millerism out of the study. The other thing was two or three witnesses. Somebody would come to me with this, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I'd put it on the back burner because I was too busy with this something else. Well, then somebody else a month or two later would come by and they'd ask me the same question. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And there have been on two or three different occasions that I put it on the back burner again. And the father sent me a third witness saying, asking the same exact question or saying the same thing. And I had a the world came to a standstill. It's like, oh my word, the father has been trying to tell me something and he sent me a three witness. He's not sending me another one. He'll send me two or three, but it never says anything about a four. So I, everything at that point, it didn't matter what. I mean, my wife has said that she's a computer widow <laughs> because every time something new comes on my plate, I'm gone. I'm on the computer day and night. And, you know, she doesn't see me. I don't help with the kids. I don't, dump the garbage <laughs> i'm just completely gone i'm worthless but i find stuff you know and i put stuff together and then i share on the inter internet and so but th those are the two games that the father plays with me and i never get it never now it's never gets to a third a second witness or well occasionally it gets to a second witness but by and large the moment something new crosses my plate i say okay i back up and i i get a kind of get my feet under me i get a feel for what's going on and I kind of come to a, okay, this is probably true. Or eh, I'm gonna have to question this a little bit more. I have to dig a little bit deeper. And so, but very, I'm, I, there'll never be a have to get me to a third witness again, you know, cause after the second witness, I'm all over it because I know, I realize the father has been trying to get my attention and I ignored it the first go around. So it's very similar in, um, in the sense that I also like to have two or three witnesses before mm -hmm. I feel comfortable um, and you can't see it, but it's also been teaching me to hear his his voice more clear as right. far as the enemy, because the enemy will like right. to steal things from you, he'll distract you, he'll say, "Oh no, yep. you, you're looking in the wrong place. Don't even bother with that." But but it, it, so you would have this pull, you know. Yeah. So I, I started to learn to listen to the Father, and he recognize, you know, it's usually jump jump right in. Here here you go. This is what where I want you to go. Right. Um, and less of me. That's the other thing is also that mm -hmm. you got yourself talking to yourself. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. I, I, I don't want if I, with somebody, I mean, I suppose I may have a style now that somebody might be recognizable, you know, Oh, Troy, that's something Troy would have written. That may be possible, but I try to, 
take Troy Miller out of everything. So I may have a style that's recognizable, but you'll never find my opinion. And if there is, I'll always admit it. This is Troy Miller speculating, or this is my opinion. Never ever will you see anything in there that's just my opinion. And I think the reason why most of my studies are so as, as long as they are, I mean, like I said, I'd love to say it in three pages, but it winds up being 17 or 19 or something, is because I give two or three witnesses. I don't just give one. And I don't say, well, the Sabbath is regularly by the moon, period, the end. I could, and it's a true statement. But there's going to be somebody out there that's going to say, well, why did you, how did you come to that conclusion? Why do you think that? So just telling the truth isn't enough in this day and age because, well, <laughs> telling the truth is a revolutionary act, according to who was that, Orson, um, Orson Welles or whoever. I don't remember who wrote that book. But anyway, telling it, you know, in the time of, oh, maybe one of you guys can quote it better than I am, but in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. There you go. So we live in an era of universal deceit. So telling the truth is a revolutionary act. Problem is, is nobody believes you when you say it. And I don't know if it's because it's me talking or because it's their heart isn't ready. They're not prepared to hear it. Who knows what the, the reason is, but you can't say the truth in one sentence. I mean, you can, but you're not going to get anybody's attention unless you prove it. And that's the reason why my studies wind up being so long is because I don't give just one witness. I'll give you three, two or three for just about every point that I make. So it winds up stacking up. I get, right. you know, 17 page studies. <coughs> oh, so. So you've got the you've got the months uh, figured out uh, the the new moons, um, you know. Then we encounter things like the word Pentecost, you, you know, because mm -hmm. once we start, okay. So so we figure out with the new moon that how the days fit and how we we got the Shabbats, and I think Exodus sixteen kind of really brings that home and how this goes down because Yahuwah tells them, you know, I'm gonna test them out. I'm gonna see how they're gonna mm -hmm. do, right? Right. So he gives them the Shabbat and the the workday and introduces them all to that. And, you know, the most common thing I hear about the moon with critics is, well, God created the moon on the fourth day. And so they go from Genesis as that's where the Shabbat started for us. Right. That's not exactly true. He didn't give us the Shabbat until Exodus 16 when they come out, when they're coming out of Egypt right that's that, that's the first place the word sabbath is in scripture is in exodus 16 but they but the critics like to say oh well, the moon was created on the fourth day so and they try to create this argument and i'm like man that's right. not even that's not even part of the argument here who it gives it to us in 16 of exodus it's it has nothing to do with genesis we weren't adam and eve weren't keeping the shabbat you know like that i mean you had him on a, i'm sure had him on a divine cycle but things were not like they are now in that time. We had the flood in between. <coughs> I think things are drastically different than, you know, you, you talk about denting Yahuwah's clock. You know, right. there is something astronomical in, in our solar system that's had an interaction with our Earth that's changed things from mm -hmm. 360 days to 365 days, basically now, right? Right. Is what it comes exactly. down to. So obviously we're not on the same calendar that Enoch was on because I got people say, well, it's Enoch's calendar or it's Zadok's calendar. Right. Well, even if, if, if that's true, it's not this, it's not the same as it was. We have 365 days right. in the calendar. We have to reconcile that. Yep. And it's done with the who was clock. It's not done with what the ancients were done doing. It's not done with what, they found in Qumran, which is two different calendars, you guys. It's a solar dial and it's a lunar um, yeah. mechanism as well. So they were using both. To right. It is a lunar solar calendar. That's what the Heavenly Father's calendar was, was lunar solar. Of course, at the time, the lunar solar uh, cycles were aligned to 360 days. I mean, yeah. so they were both on that same cycle and now they're not. And so, so you had a, some you know, perfect month each, each month, right, with that. It, it, yeah. it balances out mm -hmm. and so 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 let's talk about that denting the clock when did you realize that you know wait a minute where's 360 and 365 this can cause an issue in observation um, right the 360 day year is just something that i knew from adventism i mean i mean the prophecy right you know daniel's prophecies time time and the dividing of time that's 360 720 and 180 and add them up you get 1260 days blah 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 
So that concept, even though I didn't realize at the time that that was a lunar solar calendar that Daniel had, um, I did know that in prophecy, a year was 360 days. So it uh, was probably several years after I started keeping the lunar Sabbath that I realized, wow. hmm. Right. I, I said, okay, we've got two different, I mean, there's no way that these calendars can work identically. There had to have been something that happened and it's like, okay, did it destroy the father's calendar? Did it completely alter the father's calendar? I mean, what happened? Well, I mean, I, because this is not recorded in scripture, I have an opinion if you're interested in what happened or how. Yeah, I would like to hear it. And, and I think it, it is recorded in scripture and I'll tell you where in, in a moment. I'm not talking about okay. Noah's flood. It's the same object and in, invent, but <clears> obviously <throat> we're talking about after Noah's flood, but, 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 but between that time and us, something happened. Right. right. There were four different time frames. <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me. Four different time frames when this dent could have happened. But based on the evidence, we could say, okay, well, that couldn't have been it. Now, astronomically, the flood clearly could have been uh, the time when it was dented. The problem is, is David um, had the same 360-day lunar solar cycle that Enoch would have had, if you want to call it that, because he had a course, remember he, when he had the course of priests, the course of the priesthood, the Levites? He only come up with 24 courses. So there were only 48 weeks in a lunar solar year. In a 360-day lunar solar year, there's only 48 weeks. So each set of priests would have served twice a year. Right. Fits perfectly. No problem. So in David's, the other time frame it could have happened is uh, Joshua's long day. Because here the sun and moon stood still. And yep. notice that it was the sun and moon. If this is kind of proves that Joshua knew that the if he'd have said sun stand all he was worried about was the sun because he needed more daylight sun stand thou still if that is all he said that would have blown up the calendar but he said and the moon and the valley of Ajalon he wanted both to stop because he knew that if he only if he stopped the hour the minute hand but left the hour hand moving that that would mess things up so he stopped them both. And then whenever, you know, he kicked the Amalekites butts or whoever it was, then both of them started moving again. So the clock, even though there was a long day historically recorded, it didn't dent the clock at that time. Another time is the Exodus. I don't know if you know this, but the, the, the plagues were worldwide. Yeah, it I've been, I, it, it <laughs> that's the other not, thing. I've been telling them, you know, this just wasn't happen regionally. This that was is correct. Even that the, was worldwide. The um the eclipse, the three hour eclipse at crucifixion and the earthquake was worldwide. And and Troy, we've even some one of the students brought me a, a clip from a presentation from somebody talking about the Chinese record. And and they went to the, the exact time that Yeshua is being crucified. And lo and behold, the Chinese write, there's something strange happened, an un um unforeseen or unscheduled eclipse took place with an object other than the moon it wasn't the moon that that eclipsed the sun it was something else but it also caused an earthquake it shook the earth i think it's this planet x system that that's has a it's, cycle that that yeah. perturbs our planet and, and i what i'm about to tell you i think will lend credibility to that conclusion i think maybe it was nibiru or planet x whatever you want to call it I don't know what the cycle it was like a 3600 2600 year cycle I don't know what the cycle is but anyway. Um, Emmanuel Velikovsky you heard of him, I have and I was about to because this is what got he's the one reading his book mm -hmm. is the reason why I started considering the cross cultural because if the what the Bible is recording is true then it's going to be true all across the world, because it's not a localized event, the sun and the moon is something we all see. So if there's a long day in Joshua's story. What does that do for China and somewhere on the far side of the earth? Uh, I'll tell right? you what it does. According to Emmanuel Velikovsky, when the sun stood still in Israel, the sun was just setting in China or the far east. Yeah. And it hovered over the western horizon for the, about the space of a day. The Chinese record this long day in their history. In the Americas, the sun was just rising. And the Native Americans in both South and North America wrote of this day where the sun rose and then 
went over the stopped at the horizon and then just popped the horizon and stopped for about the space of the day. Freaked everybody out, all the whole world. They wrote about it. It's historically recorded this Joshua Sloan day. Yeah. That's so amazing. that's amazing. Yeah. It's, a, it's a three witnesses right there that yeah. this is all true and did happen. Yeah. Exactly. It and one scripture. is not connected to the other. So they didn't just kind of get up and be like, hey, let's, let's fool everybody, right? No, <laughs> yeah, no, no. They, exactly. No, they had no idea the other existed. No. no, the people in North and South America weren't even talking. You know, I mean, they whether they, there might have been some people that knew about, you know, the North American border. They, I, you know, the Apaches may have known about the Incas, but right. chances are they, you know, I don't know. But anyway, anyway, but so the other thing is after the Exodus being, uh, worldwide was uh, Hezekiah sundial. Yeah. You know, going the sun went, the sundial went backward ten degrees because he the father said, you know, give me a test. You know, so I can tell you, yeah, you can go to battle, you'll be successful. And Hezekiah was hesitant. He's like, I'm not going to test you. Well, the father was kind of mad. Said, okay, you know, some, you know, oh no, that wasn't that. It was about whether he was going to live or die, wasn't it? Live or die, yeah, right, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, live or die. You remember what it was for? It was Hezekiah's? What was he? What was he? trying to get to that yeah, i can't that I'm suddenly i've forgotten that or something it aggravates me because i've, I've known this story for forever and i can't suddenly bring it to memory but remember i may have just had covid so i may have a little covid fog <coughs> going on but anyway get this yeah, yeah. in china been, or the far yeah. in china in the far east 11. hezekiah's sundial when it went backwards 10 degrees the sun set and then pop back up in China, and they wrote about it. They were like, "What?" In the Americas, in the morning, the sun rose and then popped that went back down below the horizon, and the the Americas went, "What?" And they wrote about it. So they saw this issue that you we like to think has just happened in Israel, but no, it was a worldwide event. Exactly. It's very possible that the father used Nibiru. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure the father can, you know, tap the sun back 10 degrees, but it's also possible that he used another instrument, you know, to to his own end. If you I will. believe the I same mean, thing. So I think that uh, and according to Emmanuel Velikovsky, he wrote the uh, was it eight uh, worlds in collision the series. You know, yep. he talks about all the confl conflagrations that was going on in the cosmos at a certain point in history. And he looks into the historical record and he finds that from time immemorial i'm assuming he's talking about well he does talk about babylon from babylon forward all nations all over the world had a lunar solar calendar 360 days long 12 30 day months and they were it was based all the months were based on the cycle of the moon the entire world every nation on earth not just israel every nation on earth here's why what language did they speak in the garden of eden good question right I assume it was a Semitic tongue, and here's why. Because um, in at the flood, I mean, they all had the same language on, all over the world. They would have had to. I mean, the, the, it wasn't until Tower of Babel that the languages were right. used. So we have the Semitic tongue, and I'm going to call it that. I'll prove it here in a minute. The Semitic tongue, or what the Garden of Eden tongue, whatever you want to call it, coming out of the first 1,500 years before the flood. Then a few hundred years later, whenever they were building the Tower of Babel, it says that the Shemites, rather, I mean, everybody else was up, down on this plain of Dura building this big tower, but it said that the Shemites weren't down there, that they were in the mountains to the east. So when the father changed all the languages, what language did he not change? The Shemites, which is where we get the word Semites, and they would have been speaking a Semitic tongue so i have to believe that the hebrew tongue was spoken in the garden of eden the paleo hebrew whatever you want to call it i don't know if it, the pronunciations have changed but clearly the letters have but anyway i believe that the original tongue was the semitic tongue and um the languages are all changed and they scattered to the four corners of the earth from the tower of babel guess what calendar they took with them right the lunar solar calendar from the garden of eden right if it ain't broke you don't fix it right so all over the world, these these language groups went carrying the lunar solar calendar from the Garden of Eden. Well, they started at some point worshiping all manner of evil, worshiping all manner of gods. And at some point, Father had remember he was they were all together building this tower. He said, "Nope, I'm going to do something," and he changed their languages so they couldn't finish it. Well, now they've taken his calendar and they're worshiping all kinds of 
false gods with it. So he says, nope, not going to happen. Emanuel Velikovsky went back into history. He finds the record of these people keeping a 360-day year 30, consisting of 12 30-day lunar months. Everybody, all over the world. And then suddenly, within at one point, within the, there was 150, 200 years where everybody was scrambling to come up with a new calendar. Guess when that happened? About the 7th or 8th century BC, about the time of Hezekiah's sundial issue. Oh, wow. So, and Emmanuel Velikovsky basically points this out. Now, I don't know that he linked it to the sundial issue in scripture, but he quotes scripture throughout his book. So here was a man who had no real agenda, but he was studying ancient or ancient calendars. And he's like, whoa, look, they all, he didn't know this when he started, but he, when he's, we look back in the ancient record, they all had a, a 360 day lunar solar calendar. You know, so I'm reading this book with my knowledge of scripture and I'm saying, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, and I'm connecting all kinds of dots <laughs> because it's like, okay, this is really fixing some things that I've got with the calendar or giving me some, you know, concrete, you know, foundation for it. So anyway, I'm not going to go right out <coughs> on a limb and say that it was Hezekiah's sundial, but it was about the same time that everybody on the earth was scrambling to come up with a new calendar. Well, guess what? The Hebrews wouldn't have changed theirs. So they would have continued to keep the Heavenly Father's calendar from that point. And I believe there has been a faithful witness all over the world, um, at least one person on the world that has been keeping the Heavenly Father's calendar since creation. And I believe that based on his, or, uh, prophecy. I think you're in line, brother. That's the same opinion that I hold. Is, um, and, and, but I could see it in several places in the scripture. But that is a critical point. Um, right there, and, and I believe you are right that Velikovsky um, was looking at this, and he he was Jewish, by the way. He wasn't an Orthodox practicing Jew, but he was, right. you know, um, he was Jewish. He was aware of these Bible stories because he was brought up um, in, in Judaism. But as a yeah. as a doctor and as a scientist, well, he wasn't really technically a scientist. He was a psychologist, psychiatrist. But he had an awful lot of. Uh, initials after his name he was yeah. a very knowledgeable learned man i don't know how many different modalities he had a degree in but he was very knowledgeable very very i mean he was a genius he said things yeah. about planet venus that was not known mm -hmm. at the time that he said it it wasn't common now it wasn't even science science was was laughing at him and then later in the 60s he was <laughs> right yeah, everything yeah. he said was absolutely right about Venus. The the, yeah. the the rotation is going in the other direction. It's very hot. Um, it, all of the things that he described, and he and he described what happened to Venus. Um, well, actually, now science has proven that is he's absolutely right. correct. So, right, very knowledgeable, and I think also you would has people that he's strategically placed throughout history to carry knowledge and to bring forth you know truths. That others right. can grab onto it and you know put pieces together of you know what's really going on. Right. Yeah. Well, are you with us yet, Darla? Darla's just joining us. <laughs> she's probably got some questions too, I'm sure. Okay. Um, well, while she's getting ready, guys, let me take you to um Troy's website for, for the benefit of those that are watching. Um, so you can see the difference between this site and the other site. That is very confusing, you guys. It's creationcalendar.com. And it's very simply laid out. Um, and so you can just scroll through here. Here's all the, the teachings. Do you recall, and uh, Troy, I'm not sure if you are aware, but I actually, when we studied the calendar this year, and it was the first year I committed to it because of, you know, I knew it was going to cause division. <laughs> And it yeah. was issues. And I lost several students over this because uh, when we got to this point, talking about Pentecost, you know, mm -hmm. it was very much like Yeshua talking to his disciples about, you know, in John 6, 66, he talks about drinking his blood and eating, eating his body. And several people who had been with him for years, three years walking around with him, seeing all the miracles, suddenly when he says something so deep and profound, they, they lose it and walk away. It was same something very similar happened when I started talking to them about the impossibility. I call Pentecost that word a misnomer. It's very misleading because it's not a count of just 150. It's actually 
50 twice. You're counting more than 50. It's not just 50. Correct. And we're dealing at, for, for Shavuot, we're dealing with wheat harvest. And the fact that this day on the Christian observance comes into spring is mm -hmm. absolutely impossible for someone to grow, harvest, process, mill, and then bake two loaves of bread in just 50 days. It is absolutely impossible. You cannot do it. They don't can't even do it today with modern GMO. It takes what it takes. And so what it did for me, brother, is I had to go and see. I had to go and know everything I could know about wheat and how it's yep. grown and how it's harvested and all of that. And that's when I began to see we've lost touch to agriculture. The Bible is an agricultural book. Every feast, well, the major, the traveling feasts are all linked to a major harvest in Israel. Exactly. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so we've lost touch with that. And so it's very, very easy for us to get confused or get off track and, and you know, start keeping days that come about from, you know, the church, for one, the church. The second, it's a Greek translation. It's not in your, your Hebrew text. It says seven right. Sabbaths complete. And then you, it's very simple instructions. But yep. if, you, if you don't get the Hebrew or the, the English translation that you read there and you only get Pentecost, you're only going to count 50. You're only going to hit when you comes down the mountain and gives them verbally the Ten Commandments. But this is not officially when the law is given, you guys. No, it's not official. Yahuwah, he says it a few passages before that. He's like, I'm going to test them. I'm going to see if they're going to keep my commandments. I'm going to see if they're going to keep my Shabbats. And my, and my, and my audience, he's going to test them before he even gives it to them. And he starts them on the calendar, right. And keeping the, sh the, the work day and the Shabbat. And he's got them in this mm -hmm. rhythm. The rhythm started in Egypt. When they left, they were already on Yahuwah's calendar. He had them started on a, on a special day. It wasn't just whimsical and it just picked out of the, the area who had it specific and they got, to Elim on a specific day, one month later. And these dates are given to us and laid out to where if you just look at it very closely and see, well, wow, the 15th day, and it's a Shabbat, because, because they rest on that day, you guys. You can start putting things together and see, oh, my. First of all, we know when the Shabbat is now. It's 8, 15, 22, 29, but when we count, and we're counting, we're lining up. We're in the desert. We're not anywhere near growing wheat and harvesting wheat. And yet we're in the middle of the desert in Sinai and we're keeping this thing called Pentecost. It doesn't fit. That's why I say it's a misnomer. It's an interloper. It does not belong there. Right. So, I call it Feast of Weeks or Shavuot. Shavuot is what it's mm -hmm. called. And Feast of Weeks, because we're counting weeks, you guys, we're not counting omers. <clears throat> nowhere in the scriptures that tells you to count an omer. That comes from Judah. Judah does that because they were commanded by Constantine not to observe these feasts anymore and not to count weeks and not to keep the moons and all these kinds of things. So what do they do? They just kind of change the wording a little bit. Yeah. Oh, we're not going to count the weeks. We're going to count omers. Well, I mean, it's like a loophole in law, really. It's just kind of sidestepping what they told, were told not to do and just doing what they want to do, really. It has nothing to do with the scriptures, you guys. And, and, but yet we got Christians who cling on to that and, and, you know, they're counting homers and trying to find the Pentecost every year. And it's absolutely wrong. This site is full of loads of critical information, you guys. And, and like I was about to tell you, um, Troy, I actually went through several of these and read them um, through on a, a broadcast. And so there's, there's videos and live broadcasts where we've gone through this. Based okay. off of the, the, the email, um, well, I wouldn't say controversy, but, but critics who would, who would pose the, you know, <laughs> right. okay, but what if, and, and, you know, had the, all these arguments. And so I went here as my source because you've, you know, taken a lot of time to lay these out and it makes there are, convenient. There are so many arguments in those two studies that the proof from um, the one you were just looking at about the Count to Pentecost or the scriptural feast of weeks. Right. There is so much evidence in there. It completely undone. There, I can't think of any argument that could stand up after if you read that, that particular study. I, I agree. Is, you know, and here's the thing. 
this is not where I learned it from, you guys. You who was showing, you know, showing this to us, right? Before I came here, and this is when I was going, oh my gosh, <laughs> showing this to someone else, and then this other channel I found is called um, Lunar Lunar Sabbath. Um, same thing. I look at their videos, and they're, te- you know, t- I could see when they were teaching all these things, and I'm just now finding their video about the real. When is real Pentecost? They, they use the word Pentecost. I don't like to because it's a, it's misleading. Right. I like to say Shavuot or, or weeks. And, but there you go. It was two witnesses I got that was separate from me that I was getting confirmation that the Holy Spirit is revealing something very profound here. And there's a reason for that. It's all about his timing. But there's a reason he's revealing these things now, because that day, Shavuot, you guys, is the very day that they were in the upper room and you will pour out his spirit. Now, if, if you were the end, if you if let's play devil's advocate here, if we're the enemy and we want to disrupt, we want to steal, kill and destroy. We you see get a that counterfeit. Day happen. Yep, we know you get a counterfeit. Well, something very special happen. So we want to to remove that for any future generation. So we're going to obscure it. We're going to kind of tinker. We're going to change that. So they cannot possibly get that day right because that's when the windows of heaven are, are open. Who was doing something? He's pouring out his spirit upon all flesh, right? Or all that were in one accord in the upper room. But he's going to do this again. If the text tells us he's going to do this again, the enemy knows that. And he's going to I change agree. it. And I furthermore, agree. with the name, because some say, well, why would he change the, why would the enemy want to change the name? Listen, if, if the scripture says where two or more are gathered in my name, I'm there also, or, you know, any of the other three, 400 scriptures talking about his name, call upon his name, honor his name, all these things. The enemy knows that. Isn't it plausible that he would change that? He would not want you to have access to him to where two or three are gathered in his name. He is going to be there as well. He's going to give us a fraud. And so, we can't under, un, underestimate the enemy and tinkering and, and, and tampering with these things to hide it from us. Furthermore, he can't do anything that Yahuwah doesn't allow him to do. And we found in, in the prophets where Yahuwah said, you know what? I'm going to let, I'm going to cause you to forget these things. You're not going to remember. You're going to go worship idols. You're going to call on other deities, the whole nine yards. He, he laid it out for us. Right. But then he has the caveat of saying, but I'm going to bring you back. There's going to come a day where Ephraim says, what do I have to do with idols? <laughs> is the story of the prodigal son. And he's going to restore all of these things to us. That's the time we're in now. It's a very exciting time. So, again, creationcalendar.com. I wanted to plug you for a little bit and give you a, a little break when you're speaking, Troy. Uh, Thank you. And uh, point people to this information. You guys, don't take my word for it. Go there go and do the due diligence of, of studying these things out. And, I, and I'm looking at Philo and Josephus here. I love that, that Troy takes, and this is how I like to research. I like to look at historical, what, what were they doing in ancient time? What, what were the, what it's recorded somewhere. It's called historians. We can go to, to mm-hmm. Philo and Josephus and get yep. answers there. We don't have to get doctrine from Philo or Josephus. Nothing about that. We're getting an honest, unbiased record of what was taking place because you know they don't have a dog in the fight today you guys right there's no That's youtube right. channel philo and josephus where they're trying to convince you that we're supposed to be reckoning the new year at the equinoxes right a, a bee, these things that didn't come from babylon they were doing that that's because that they were on still on you was calendar at that point you guys that is right that's absolutely right which is the reason why you find all this stuff about um, and Philo's writings about, you know, the end of the first week, you have the half moon and you have the end of the second week, you have the full moon. And <laughs> yeah. I mean, he flat out says it, you know, he so, does say it, but and, also, uh, you know, in, in uh, you got <laughs> witness in, in um, Enoch, where it talks about the seventh month and going and finding the crescent of the moon to, to determine the new month. So there are parts of, Enoch that you can see where there's a witness there, but I, I tend not to use those books, but because they also contradict themselves, right. especially Jubilees. Jubilees has 29 very questionable passages that contradicts the whole of the text. And so, um, but when you've got something like Philo and 
um, Josephus, where it's not it's not apparent anyone's coming and tampered with their work with an agenda. Right. You can pretty much look at it as historical truth. And I can tell you very simply how to read these manuscripts and come away with truth rather than tripping up over something. And it's very simple. It's called Isaiah 820 to the law and the testimony. If it speaks not according to this word, there's no light in it. So I will read anything that's not scripture. I will read and filter it through Isaiah 820. If I see something in there that goes against the Torah, or if I see that go now, when it says testimony, it says it means the testimony of the prophets is what it, I mean, because it's a repeat of the Torah, what was taught in the Torah, because the, 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 the true prophets from the father didn't teach contrary to the law. They just no, didn't. They didn't. So that's what Isaiah is talking about, to the law and the testimony of the prophets to the Torah. And that's that's the word that's used to the Torah and the testimony of the prophets. If it speaks not according to this word, there's no light in it. So I think. Um, there's a reason why Jubilees and Enoch's not part of scripture. If they were very, very historically, very important Hebrew manuscripts, very important. I wouldn't, I've got copies of both. I wouldn't throw them out for nothing. We do too. We but, don't throw them out. Yeah. No, we just don't. Even though I know there's, a, from it. yeah, even though I know there's error in there, I don't, I, I'll still keep them because I know how to discern what's true. The moment I see something that, and I'm not saying I have immersed myself in so much in scripture that I immediately recognize it because sometimes they don't immediately, but it, re it either will resonate in my spirit. It's like, ah, that sounds right. Or it'll be, huh? and then I'll go and start, you know, re reading through scripture and say, okay, is that right or not? <laughs> you right. know, so, and that's, you know, where the spot, the father has led me. He's so many times the spirit has impressed upon my heart to think or do this out of the other thing that now when I don't get that confirmation that I don't get that peaceful easy feeling if you want to say it if i don't get that peace or that harmony i go Rrr, and i have to go to the back and say okay is this true or is this not but if it is true it typically it's just like you know swallowing pudding it just or, or jello it just, it just goes down real easy because yeah. i have immersed myself in scripture enough to where and the spirit has you know worked in my head i you know well my heart whatever enough to where it's like oh okay that sounds right but I don't, I mean, I'm not saying that I just immediately start writing about it just because I think that, but I don't have to try to undo it first, I guess is what I'm saying. Then I just go looking for evidence for it and I always find it. But if it goes down sideways, you know, it's like swallowing, you know, eggshells. It's like, <laughs> you know, right. then, okay, okay. Now I look and chances are when I look, I'll find something that disproves it. That's just the way the, the spirit has worked with me for the last 20 years. You know, I, I'm not saying I'm, you know, can't be fooled because I'm sure, sure I can, but, you know, by and large, the, the father through the spirit has, um, he just gives me peace when I read something that's true and it goes down sideways when it, when I come across something that's false. I think that's just really good uh, hermeneutics, Troy, yeah. that, that you operate that way, because that's, that's way I've also tried to uh, reconcile these texts is if it, if it contradicts the word, you 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 can't you know take that it's, it's like right. taking Talmud and and you know con because it the, what it says about Christianity and you use it as an evidence it it mm -hmm. just it, it doesn't make any yeah. sense right but there are places in there where you can find things that where it it actually jives with the Bible it rings true they're they're yeah. confirming one another right, right? that is when I, you can use those passages right I have a quote from the Talmud that talks about the lunar Sabbath saying that it's by the moon so i that's probably the only quote <laughs> that i know of that i would use but you know still i mean if somebody wants to see it from the talmud i'll show it from the talmud even though it's full of all kinds of other oh my goodness right. that's one of the nastiest books that's ever been written but and i say that with all sincerity i've got some quotes that'll absolutely curl your hair that you'll find in the talmud especially when they talk about yeshua and what's happening with yeshua yeah well, incidentally, they, they did record the day of the crucifixion and the damage that was done to the temple and all that kind of stuff. So it's really interesting to see that and then to see that they come away with the conclusion. You don't see in there. Oh, my gosh, we must have killed the Messiah, even though that there were some Pharisees who were on board with Yeshua. They just didn't believe he was God. Right. They believed that he was right. a big, big time prophet and a, and a right. sage and all this. But they weren't going to go that full length and say, OK, he's the son. Um of, of the most high um but it's there in the talmud and so the, the, even those extra biblical books that are full of a lot of deceit you know there are times where there's there is truth recorded there 
but you right. got to take it like Troy says, you got to kind of weigh and balance. You got to filter, not just take the whole book as that's truth. You really right. got to go line by line, precept by precept and run it through that filter Troy was talking about. Yep. I can show you from history that that at least a couple of the calendars that are in the book of Enoch are nothing more than the ancient Egyptian calendar where it talks about the three or the three 91 day quarters you know, it has a 30, 30, 31, 30, 30, 31, you know, to get those, you know, 364 days, right. Which of course now we know that's not true because it's 365 and a quarter or whatever. So, but at the time that Enoch, or I shouldn't say Enoch at the time, they couldn't measure that quarter in that time, brother. They couldn't measure no, that. Quarter. Probably not. They could not only well. <laughs> visual observation. They didn't have, you know, sophisticated right. equipment that like we today, they can get down to the millisecond until, right. 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 I don't know what technology they had back in those days, but I know they initially they came up 364 after they bounced out of the 360. Yeah. And but it, that's nothing more than the ancient Egyptian calendar. Well, how did that get in the Book of Enoch? Well, it's very simple. The Book of Enoch was added to dozens of times over dozens of centuries after Enoch wrote what he wrote. Yeah. And how that happened is, in essence, the any time an anonymous prophecy came in to the temple, they slid it under the you know, the temple door and it didn't have a name at the end of it, they would add it to the book of Enoch. That was their policy. And the reason why is because they didn't, Enoch didn't, I mean, he lived on the other side of the flood. You know, they didn't know whether he's alive or dead or in heaven. I mean, they had their own theology on that. But, you know, the point is, is, you know, they had what they considered the book, you know, Enoch wrote, and it was very special to them. And so when they had an anonymous prophecy, they if it had the father's name in it, they would just add it to the book of Enoch. That was just what they did. And scholars will tell you based on syntax, link, language, the words that were used, phraseology that was used, the idioms that were used, that it was added to dozens of times over dozens of centuries. So the book of Enoch, there, Enoch wrote some of it, but he didn't write all of it. So some of them were maybe good. Some of them were maybe maybe anonymous prophets. I don't know. Why, why wouldn't the father tell him, tell him your name, you know, right. you know, I don't know. I mean, to my knowledge, he didn't have anonymous prophets. They all came and they announced who they were, but anyway, whether they were true or false, the point is, is I read Enoch the same way I do anything else. You know, I filter it through the law and the prophets. Simple as that. Yeah. So Troy, you're saying that, um, the, the, that pattern came from an Egyptian calendar. Yeah. That 30, 30, 31, 30, 30, the different seasons, 91 day seasons. That was the ancient Egyptian calendar. You can look and, um, probably wikipedia and you find wow. ancient ancient egyptian calendar and that that was one of the the iterations that they had for their calendar at one point in history when i think the year probably was 364 because remember there was at 150 200 years after the, the father dented his calendar i like to say that the cosmos was kind of in disarray and at one point it may have been 364 years but eventually it oozed, it oozed out to 365 and a quarter that's the only conclusion I can come to is because it just the whatever, however we, I mean, the, basically what happened is it looks like the sun moved five days further away and the moon moved half day closer. So anyway, myth, the pagan mythology went like this because they, they actually saw the what was going on in the cosmos when this, the calendar was dented. And the heathens or pagans, whatever they wrote about, because they worshiped these gods that were in the heavens. So they thought, oh, the gods are angry with each other. They're fighting or whatever. And what happened was, is apparently um, Venus entered. Well, prior to a certain point, Venus was not on any ancient star map. No, I mean, I think uh, Jonathan touched on this earlier, but when about Velikovsky. But when he was looking at ancient calendars, he was looking at their star maps and Venus didn't exist. So Velikovsky's conclusion was that Venus was a comet that came into the solar system and disrupted things. It came very, very close to Mars. Mars was the god of war to the pagans. So, and originally Mars was a blue planet, not a red planet, prior to all this happening. So, you know, now scientists say, oh, there used to be water on Mars. Well, may, may very well be, but anyway, so Venus is going through and disrupting everything. And one of the things that Velikovsky proved is space is not electri electrically neutral, that it's charged. I mean, now science will tell you, oh, it's, there's, it's neutral. There's no, there's no charge up. Well, how can the sun have a negative plasma cloud or you know, they have a positive solar flare 
there, there's positive or negative energy coming out these solar flares they're they're charged it's not neutral and so <clears throat> Velikovsky, based on what he was reading, and see, he was reading mythology, but his cons, his in his mind, if they were writing it, it doesn't necessarily mean what how they wrote it was true, but they, it was based on something they were seeing with their eyes, and they were describing it the best possible way they could. Zechariah 5 is a perfect example. He sees a nuclear bomb coming out of Shinar, which is Iraq, and going and destroying um, Israel. He describes it as being so many cubits long, so many cubits wide, has little teeny wings at the bottom like a stork, and it's in two stages, and there's a fire at the bottom, and then when it separates, there's another fire that shoots it. I mean, it's a two-stage ballistic missile. That's what he's seeing. He calls it a scroll, and it has a lead lid on it. Read it in Zechariah 5, and it says in the, there's a, a lead basket, and there's a lead lid. In this basket, there's a strange woman in this. It's like, what in the world? What is no, excuse me. Yeah, it says strange woman. And there's a lead lid on it. It's a mistranslation. If you look at woman and fire, they're the same exact three letters, just different vowel points. Exactly right. It's a strange fire that was in. Well, that's a nuclear weapon. It had a lead lid. It even says it has a lead lid on it in scripture. And on in the nose of this missile, this scroll, this flying scroll is what he calls it. Well, Zechariah is seeing this in his mind's eye. He has no idea what it is. The father's showing him in the future. So he writes it down. Okay, it's two stages, so many cubits long so many cubits wide it has strange fire at the bottom strange fire in the second stage it's got a strange fire you know in the top with a lead lid and this ifa this ifa basket with a strange fire in it. and he that's all he's seeing and the reason why i know it's nuclear is because when it hits it destroys wood and stone i'm sorry but conventional weapon re weapons don't destroy stone only nuclear destroys stone right so just read zechariah 5 and you'll get an understanding of why velikovsky thought that he would look at the mythology and he was trying to put himself there and what they were seeing and why they were coming to the conclusions they did. So what he did is he, the way he, his conclusion was that space is electrically charged because the heathens were seeing Mars and Venus duking it out. There was static electricity, lightning, uh, planetary sized lightning, <laughs> smashing each other around. Oh, the gods are angry with each other. Plasma. Well, yeah, it was static electricity, and you can't get static if space is electrically neutral. It doesn't work. So they were seeing, literally seeing lightning bolts. Well, here's the story. The moon was in, is a little girl, is in love with Mars, the god of war. And the moon goes to her daddy, which is Jupiter or Saturn, and beg in a different era, begs him, let me go out and help Mars. And Jupiter's response is, you're just a little girl. Stay your butt at home and be safe. Well, being the impetuous little girl she is, she goes out to help Mars anyway. And there's an electrical static, a lightning comes off of Venus and smashes the moon. Well, guess what? That really happened. The heathens, they were, it looks like mythology and it's a bunch of fairy tales, but guess what? They were literally, they worshiped these things. They were literally recording what they were seeing. Well, do you think an electrical discharge from something the size of a planet hitting the moon, do you think that might move it a half day closer to the Earth or shorten its orbit a little bit by half day? Because prior to that, it, the moon cycle was always 30 days every month. There were no 29 days or 29 and a half as it wind up. So that's how the moon got on a 29 and a half day cycle. Is there something happened? And you know, the father's, here's my philosophy. The father's in charge of everything. The father's the creator. That makes him either in charge of everything or he's in charge of nothing at all. If he created it, he's either in charge of everything or nothing at all. So my philosophy is he's in charge of everything because he made it. You know, he's, he, well, there's a, and the reason I say that is there's a prophecy or a passage in Isaiah. I think it's 26. I could be wrong. But one of the pots that the father made in this, I'm paraphrasing, he says, have you ever, the question is, have you ever seen a pot turn back to the father and say, hey, what do you think you're doing? He's the potter. We're the clay. Whatever we come out at, that's how he wanted us. And then, of course, in Hebrews, we find that, you know, some cloth, some of the pots were made for honor and some were made for dishonor or destruction. So, I mean, the father made us. He, so either he's like I said, either he's in control of everything or he's in control of nothing at all. My conclusion is he's in control of everything, which means that whatever the heathens were seeing, you know, with this cosmic conflagration is what I call it. I think the father was completely in control of it. And he knew exactly that the moon was going to be a half day closer. He knew exactly that the sun was going to be five and a quarter days further away. And 
he also knew that the Hebrews, his chosen nation, would continue to keep the lunar Sabbath. And he knew that, the, and this is the reason why he did it, is because the heathens were worshiping false gods using his calendar. No different than they were building the Tower of Babel using the language of the Garden of Eden. So the father dented the languages. He scattered them, and they stopped building the tower. So now they're all over the earth, and they're worshiping false gods. So he basically changes their calendar so they can't do what they were doing. So they all scramble around for 150, 200 years trying to figure out, oh, we're going to come up with a new calendar. And so they did. Now they can worship. They came up with the pagan planetary week. Now we can have Saturday, Sunday, Moon Day, Mars Day, Mercury's Day, Jupiter's Day, Venus Day very easily because they had to come up with their own calendar. The other one didn't work as the way it did. Here's the thing. The only two things that Israel had the adjustments that they had to make was now they had, instead of having two new moon days every month, now sometimes you only had one because you can't have a 29 and a half day month. So they had, they would, it wasn't toggling back and forth. It wasn't always 29, 30, 29, 30, 20. I mean, it, that I've seen four 30 day cycles in a row and four 29 day cycles in a row in the 20 plus years I've been doing this. So, but you'll never get five. Do you think never that, that, that effect of that oscillating back and forth was the, the, um, the solar system settling back down? Yeah, into yeah I do. Yeah. Getting into it, a routine. That's why I think they stopped at 364 at one point and thought that the year was 364 days long. Because I mean, it probably was for, I don't know, 20, 30, 50 years. I don't know. But they thought, oh, okay, it's done. Well, it settled uh, a little bit further more, and we wound up with 365 and a half. It kept settling. But the only two changes that Israel, the two alterations that Israel had to do with the calendar is they no longer had always two days two day of a new moon. Sometimes they had one. Guess what? There's not a single place anywhere in Torah that says, thou shalt have two days of a new moon. Right. I think the, father, think the father foreknew that, so he didn't write that in stone. I think that. The other thing is, is every once in a while, because now the lunar cycle and solar cycle were different, it's 311 days, the, the solar cycle is 11 days longer than the lunar cycle. So every two or three years, you have to add a 13th month in order to keep Passover in the spring. Guess what? There's not a single place in Torah that says, thou shalt have 12 months in a year. Think the Father foreknew this? Absolutely. So Israel could make those two changes and continue to keep the calendar of creation without abrogating or, or adding to the law. They did not add to the law. The law didn't say do or don't do this. There's right. no legislation. And so they could do that because they wanted to continue to keep the feast at the right time. They wanted to continue to keep the Sabbath at the right time. But they noticed the same as the pagans did that, oh, calendar don't work no more. Well, that was their conclusion. They fixed it by doing those two things, which there's absolutely no law against them doing that in Torah. So the father knew that his people would continue to, they'd figure out a way. This is a Troy Miller quote, find a way to obey. Real simple, it rhymes, find a way to obey. That's all Israel did then. That's all we're doing today is we're trying to find a way to obey. Simple as that. Amen. Darla, did you have more questions from the, the uh, chat? There have been questions put, put in the chat as have we've been speaking. Um, oh, no. I'm sorry. Yeah, for Darla. sure. Uh, I, uh, I don't, let's see. It doesn't matter if they raise their hand, they ask their own question, but if you want to field the questions, that's perfectly fine. Doesn't matter to me. Or well, they can, it doesn't matter. Yeah, they can ask their own questions if uh, you guys want to go to that. Here's um, one that I had I had put out there. Um, another question or comment, since we, this sort of follows in with what we're talking about here. I have heard of, of people gravitating to an Enoch calendar, a Zadok calendar, and a calendar presented in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, I guess a book has been written and they use Sunday to Saturday to talk about it. So it's really ridiculous. But what are your thoughts on these, Troy? Um, I don't know that I've heard about the one that was in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I think maybe I have here just recently. Um, <coughs> Ken Johnson. Ken Johnson is um, really talking about this uh, little the sundial thing and mm -hmm. that it was a solar calendar. He, he it doesn't really go into a lot about the solar lunar calendar, right. which is the obvious thing that's going on for me. But, you know, sometimes when people are writing books and they have an outline and stuff, they kind of stick to their narrative and then they, right. they'll dig their heels in as, as choice. Right. They won't even address the other things. But technically, you had two different calendars. Right. There. The lunar and solar cycles are different. Yeah. Um, and the, here's the thing. You can't track them both on the same 
mechanism. So right. they had, they did. Israel had a sundial, which is why the, uh, the man from Galilee said, are there not 12 hours in a day? He was talking about 12 equal hours. Didn't matter whether it was winter or summer when the days were 40, the hour might have been 45 minutes long versus an hour and 15 minutes long in the summer. I don't know what it was, but they were divided into 12 equal right. things. And what an were they doing with the moon, Troy? Because the, every night, it, we're, is it one seventh or one fourteenth? <laughs> what is it every, every, um, every night where it's the a moon. fraction? Are you talking about how far the moon moves each night? I've forgotten what the fraction is. It would but be easy to figure illumination out. Illumination on the moon. I think yeah, it's the illumination on the moon is 14%, like 14%, 14, 14 percent, Jonathan. Something like that. And yeah. it builds. So yeah. we can track every day. In uh -huh. other words, I tell my students, if you were in a, in a coma in ancient times for three or four weeks and you suddenly woke up, mm -hmm. that you, could, mm -hmm. you couldn't go outside under the sun and go, oh, I know exactly what day it is. But you yep. could potentially <laughs> go outside at night and go, Oh, wow. And know exactly what day of the month it was. I challenge people. I tell them if, if I, the way I use it, three, three, four weeks in a coma, that would be perfect as well. But I say, OK, we're in a shipwreck where we have no idea how long we were at sea. We crash into the beach. We have no idea how long we've lain, uh, lain unconscious on the beach. You and I both wake up. I said you would have to go and find somebody and ask them what day it was. I would know what day it was within 48 hours because if it's in the dark phase of the moon, I, it might be 48 hours where I wouldn't see the moon, right. but so, but if it's, if the, if it's during the 28 days that the moon, moon is actually visible in one day, less than 24 hours, I would know where I am in the month. Here's another witness for you guys right there. I, I was Simple telling you that. that, that the moon reckons these times that it, you, it's like the big, out, big hand and the, big hand, little hand. the clock, you yep. know, and you're it's, looking. The sun will tell you when the day begins, the moon will tell you what day it is. There you go. The sun tells you, let's write this down. The sun will tell you that the day has begun. The moon will tell you what day it is. Simple as that. Right. And we've had a lot of teachers recently on, on YouTube that they've started to regard new moon, but they hmm. still don't realize that our Shabbat is tied to the moon. Right. And if they, the new moon is where it begins. I, I told my story before you came on how I came to get where I'm at. And it was from the study of new moon because I started keeping the feast and I knew that they were regulated by the moon, but the lunar months and new moon was the beginning of it. But I had in my Adventist upbringing had absolutely no training in what a new moon was. Scientifically, they said conjunction was new moon. Boom, there's conjunction. It falls in this midnight to midnight lunar or midnight to midnight Roman day. If conjunction falls in that, they call that new moon day. That's astronomically when the month begins. The Jews, they say, oh, well, I see the first visible crescent. The next day is the first day of the month. Well, those, those two events can be two days apart. When conjunction takes place and when you actually see the moon could be up to 48 hours. And eh, it's usually 46, never quite 48. But it can be anywhere from 15 hours to 48 hours, 46 hours after conjunction takes place. So depending on where you are on the earth, when conjunction takes place. Okay, let me say it that way. So, you know, science and the Jews were not talking about the same thing. So I'm like, er, back to square one. So I learned to not trust what the Jews said because they copied the, the where they got their new moon was from Babylon. I'm glad you they, said that, Troy, because that is really critical for, for, for those that are coming out of Christianity. Their first stop is at Judah. Yeah. And they, we, we all did it. We all went to yeah. Judah for yeah. the answers because they must know. Yeah. I assumed. I did. I assumed. I did too. Mm -hmm. But I didn't realize, oh my gosh, Israel is blinded. That means all of us, Judah and Ephraim, are all blind. We're all blinded mm -hmm. to some degree. So we can't necessarily go to Judah and expect they're going to have the calendar right. Because, you know, when I, when I did that, you know where it led me? It led me to Hillel. It led me to the Saturday is the Shabbat. And so right. the Jews must be right. You guys, they're not right. <laughs> I, no, they are not. I see a question. If we're done with this topic, I see a question from Bonnie over here about the Southern Hemisphere. Any question? tips? Pardon? Go ahead and ask, ask your question, whoever it is. Oh, it was Bonnie. I'm just reading the chat. She said, any tips for us here in the Southern Hemisphere? Um, and I, I can give you a uh, uh, some tips. You're obviously your seasons are six months apart from the northern hemisphere. So when your wheat, your wheat <coughs> is growing basically in our winter, your barley is growing in our autumn. Um, 
So um, my response is this. Uh, if you were to keep the festivals based on the, the harvests in the Southern hemisphere, you'd be keeping them six months different from, from everybody else. Is that right? Is that wrong? I don't know. Uh, you would be following the harvest, which is what we would be doing in Israel. Uh, that's what we're, and we follow the harvest in the Northern hemisphere. So would you be wrong? I don't know. Scripture doesn't say, but scripture does say that the, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north? He's talking about the northern hemisphere, the city of the great king. So if you're going to keep the feast when the father keeps them, then that would almost indicate that you would be keeping them six months out of season with your own harvests down there. If that bothers you, what I would do is I would take it up with the father. You can cast lots. That's another study if you want to get into it. Yeah, casting of lots is a way to communicate with the father. It's never been taken from us. Um, I can tell you how I do it. I, we don't have to do it now. That could be for another topic. But Or I can send you a study. If you'd like that, you've got my email address. Just say, send me the study on that. I'll, I'll, it's from scripture. It's based on scripture, nothing but. Um, and my own experience learning how. Okay, that's all recorded in this study. But anyway, asking or if you follow your conscience. If you're in the Southern hemisphere and you wanna keep them at the same exact time that the father does, then that means six months different from your own harvests. If you'd rather keep them with your own harvest, I can't tell you that that is wrong. Um, the new moons um, are basically gonna be the same for all of us. It's just be your month might be, I'm saying it's the seventh month, it might be the first month for you, okay? I, I don't make that distinction. I'm just gonna call it, if it's first month here, I'm gonna call it first month when I'm sending out the newsletter. But um, I, I would say follow your conscience at this point, uh, because if, again, if you're a child of the king, the spirit's going to impress upon your heart how you should be doing. If you feel, if somehow it feels sideways to do it at a different, you know, six months after they're doing it in Northern Hemisphere, then follow your instinct. If, if it feels comfortable, more comfortable for you, follow your instinct. But the moment you feel like it's wrong or you need to question it, question it. Don't hesitate because that, that's the father sending you a witness. You know, you're, it might be you the first time you get a thought in your head, hmm, this doesn't seem right. Well, don't wait, you know, I mean, you can wait. Somebody else like me or, you know, Jonathan or somebody has a different opinion about it may come along and, and say something and it goes, ah, that would act as a second witness for what you're already thinking. You don't have to wait for that second witness, but. Like I say, it, you can get to the answer really quickly just by casting lots. And that would be the father's answer for you. I don't, I don't know if I, Bonnie, if I answered your question. I'm trying to unmute. Thank you, Troy. Yeah, that was, <laughs> it just seems like it's, yeah, everything's about the North, but there's half of the world down here. And I understand that. Absolutely. Yeah. They came out yeah. of on a certain time, at a certain time. And that's when the feasts are, as far as I'm concerned. That is what I feel is a good thing to believe. Right. But if I was a farmer and I had to plant crops and things, I'd be doing it different, I think. Well, that's true because, it, I mean, that, it, Israel was an agricultural society. Everything revolved around the feasts or the, the harvests. The, you know, the feasts were linked to the harvest. So absolutely, that's true. My, father, my grandfather was a farmer. And um, I wish that he had taught me some of the things that he knew that he, he just didn't do that, but that's okay. I'm not a farmer, but I do, I garden. I do, I do have, I, every year we do something, so, but. Thank you, Thank you so much. I, I would like to say, Bonnie, real quickly, I had another uh, Lunar Sabbath keeper from, I'm pretty sure it's Australia. I don't think it was New Zealand. I'm pretty sure it was Australia. And they sent me a picture of a first visible crescent and it's, and I, we had both, we had both seen it and his was tipped, mine was tipped to the left and his was tipped to the right. I think it was completely backwards from what I see. Cause I, and I've been asking people, please send, especially the, the closer to the, 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 whether it be close the last week or the first week, anything that's close to the sliver, because they're tipped differently based on our point of view, our perspective. And I actually put his, the photograph he sent me as my desktop photo it is so cool. It, it's different because it's backwards from what I'm expecting. And it's an absolutely beautifully uh, cropped and framed picture. It's very sharp in focus. 
And it's so cool that I made it my desktop. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. Very Troy, um, can you speak on the difference between uh, a continuous seventh day count and Yahuwah's seventh day count? Sure. Um, there, the weeks in scripture are obviously seven days long. You work six days, you rest on the seventh. There's absolutely no lunar Sabbath keeper that I know of that believes otherwise. I know we get accused of having an eight or nine day week because of the new moon period. At the end of the fourth week, you have those either one or two new moon days before the next week begins. Oh, you've got an eight or nine day week. Uh, no, we don't. We work six days. We end on the Sabbath. And these days are new moon days. It's a third category of day. It's not part of the week. They're completely separate. And I can prove it from scripture. <clears throat> That's study if you'd like. I be just ask for it about the new moons being a third category of day. If you put third category in your question, I'll know exactly what study you're referenced to. Yeah, we read so, we read that uh, as a study a lot a yeah. live stream actually of yeah. that particularly because that that was one of the same thing. I right. I hear the same so, questions. The weeks have always been seven days long as far as the father's concerned. The pagans copied it for whatever reason. Seven days probably like we talked about earlier, a counterfeit. You know, it has to be kind of close to the original. Otherwise, uh, if the learned or the wise would say, well, that's false. So they make it really close to fool people, the ones who aren't quite so sharp. Exactly. So we have two seven week cycles, but the pagan one is just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ad nauseum. The fathers is interrupted every week with the new moon days. Yeah. So, um, so technically, the pagan calendar uh, of observing the seventh day would be very similar to what Christians and Judah is doing. That seven yeah, days, they've got the same calendar. Yeah, it's the same it's thing. All, they're both they're both observing the Gregorian calendar, and it's very so, ironic because they come and say that we're keeping the Babylonian calendar. You this you know, <laughs> it's like oh my gosh, brother. <laughs> it's it's and see that's almost a true argument because Babylon had a lunar solar calendar. Right, but but now they Hewitt didn't get his calendar from Babylon. Babylon, no, he, they, he didn't. <laughs> the Babylon was just they kept that calendar out of the Garden of Eden at a certain point. When the, the father did it his calendar, then Babylon came up with something else. But the point is, is at one point, Israel and Babylon had the same calendar. You're and right. that's what they're accusing us of for exactly. whatever reason. I don't know that's why. Where but Judah, that's, that's where Judah went to exile, you guys. And that's where <laughs> Daniel was, was there. Now, if the Magi were following stars and they knew how to read the stars and, 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 and know what was going on, that means in Babylon, they had a pretty good um knowledge base from the hebrews that had come to babylon right mm -hmm. so if we see similarities between yahuwah's calendar and babylon it's probably may be connected to the hebrews in some way too because they were there and they were yeah. part of the court well, Sh that's, that's and Abednego, you... that they were part of the court right mm -hmm. these were learned hebrews before you came on i was uh visiting with uh three or four people five people that were had come on early and we talked about that a little bit um where the the hebrews picked up that's the reason why you have um nisan elul tammuz uh, and bull and i think that's the four pagan those are babylonian names of the months right um you know that's how that got into scripture that that came out of ezra and nehemiah you don't see that prior to ezra and nehemiah that's always one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve First month, seventh month that's exactly yeah, exactly right, boy. but exactly historically right. this i mean this is they learned these and that babylon was keeping a lunar solar calendar at that time but they had names for their lunar months. So that they were there for 70 years. I mean, that, that's what, two, three generations? Pieces Long enough to know the calendar, right? And learn Long it. enough to learn the pagan calendar. So they yeah. brought back. And so that rather than using Abib, which was the title for the first month, they started using Nisan. Yeah. Well, right, wrong, or indifferent. I, I think that was wrong, personally. But that's what they were doing. So Ezra and Nehemiah, those are historical books. They're just writing down what Israel was doing historically. So they weren't judging. They were just saying, you know, Elul or Bull, whatever month that they were in. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine, you know, having a month named after Tammuz, which is where we get one of the very first sun gods, you know, that we have in history. So, I mean, why that, you know, they thought that was somehow appropriate to put in scripture, I don't know. But, you know, it, it proves a counterfeit. It proves where Israel originally got some of these pagan, half pagan, whatever you want to call it. They were Judaized. 
they can't right. that, the reason why they're still doing it now is because of the, the babylonian rabbis that remained in in <clears throat> in babylon rather than going back to israel that's where the babylonian talmud came from is these yeah. rabbis that remain behind exactly right that, that's how you have a 108 year old rabbi named kaduri in I, modern day iraq right is because they never some never went back they, not all the jews went back home some stayed. only only 10 percent went home with ezra nehemiah 10 percent 90 percent remained yeah. Mm. Yep. any more questions you guys I, yeah, I had a question. Troy, what do you say to people that say, well, the, the sun and the moon weren't even created till the fourth day, so how can the moon be regarded to Shabbat? <clears throat> I have an answer for that from scripture, and it's one you all will, the moment I say it, you're going to go, ah. <laughs> um, let me read it. <clears throat> the Hebrew word for day is yom, correct? Do you know what it means mm -hmm. literally? No. I mean, in Strong's or whatever the definition of the word yom is. Heat no. of the day. Heat. That's the root of it is heat, meaning heat from the sun. Ooh. Okay. I want to wow. read something to you. And this is verse, just one verse five. And Elohim called the light day, the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first yom. And then at the end of the second day, we verse eight. And Elohim called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. I thought the sun, moon, and stars weren't invented, created until the fourth day. Uh, the end of the third day, verse, <clears throat> where is it? Um, struggling to find the end of the third day. But anyway, it says the same thing. The evening and the morning were the third day. So we have three days that are on the calendar prior to the fourth day. And it says evening and morning. I'm sorry, but if you'll read Genesis one again, we have the heavenly father creating a light and it says that the light was good. <laughs> and what does it do? All right, I'm gonna read you the definition of this light. And it says in the earlier verse three, and Elohim said, let there be light. And there was light. And Elohim saw the light that it was good. And he divided the light from the darkness. And Elohim called the light day and the darkness he called night. I'm sorry, but the sun and moon were created in Genesis 1 verse 1, where it says, in the beginning, Elohim created heaven and earth. It wasn't just the earth it was created. It was everything you can see from the earth as well. Heaven was also created, meaning that everything that you can see, planets, stars, whatever you want to call them, everything that's out there was there already. They just weren't turned on. But in verse uh, three, let there be light and there was light. The father lit the sun in Genesis one, verse three. But that means he had to have created it prior. And very clearly he did And when he created heaven and earth. Guess what? It says that the earth was without form and void and darkness. Pay attention to that word. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of Elohim moved upon the face of the waters. If the second month after, remember the, the months were lunar in scripture. If the second month after creation began with the new moon and the month that we're in right now began with the new moon, what do you suppose the very first month of earth's history began with? Is this a live audience? Yep. It was created with a new moon. It began with a new moon. And it's right there in Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2. It was dark. The dark phase of the lunar cycle is your new moon. And then he lit the sun and boom, the sun and moon were illuminated. Well, guess what? When he created them, they started moving at that moment because it, they were the clock. In verse uh, 14, where the father introduces the concept <clears throat> of the sun and the moon and the stars, the two great lights, the greater light and the lesser light. It says that he, it doesn't say he created them. That's the Hebrew word barach, B-A-R-A, -A, the way we spell it. It says made, and Elohim made two great lights. That is a different Hebrew word. It's asa, which means advanced upon or appointed. Well, Jonathan, if you're 
a general in my army and I come up and I pin the stars on your lapel and say, okay, you're a general. Did you just boom, all of a sudden, bang, you created at that moment? Or did you exist prior to that appointment, prior to me advancing to you? <laughs> Naturally, you were already there. I just advanced upon something that already existed. That Hebrew word asa is the same word that you would use when you say, did you make your bed? Yes, mommy, I made my bed. He made the sun, moon, and stars, and I made my bed. It's the same Hebrew word. It's very, asa. Very well put, brother. And it means advanced upon. I, if the bed was messy. I advanced upon it, I rearranged it, made it how I wanted to, and now it's ready to get in the next day. So the sun, moon, and stars were not created from scratch on day four. They were appointed on day, they were given their job description on day four. That was it, because they were already doing it, because it says first day, second day, third day. Remember, the sun tells you that the day begins, the moon tells you what day it is. If that's true on the second month or today, then that was true in the first month. So the sun, it, there's, you don't have an evening, morning, you don't have light and darkness. This is the light he called day and the darkness he called night. You can't have day and night unless the sun's doing it. That's the only light in our heaven, in our cosmos that causes day and night to exist on this earth. So the sun could not have been created on the fourth day. It had to have been created during this unnamed, unnumbered segment of time when it was dark. New moon. It was the new moon segment, and the Father created heaven and the earth. He created when he created the heavens. That's when the sun, moon, and stars were all slung out there. But then he lit it on the first day. Boom! Everything's lit. Well, if he ex they they already started moving. They were doing their thing because they're a clock. They had to have been moving at the moment he created them because I mean here's twelve o'clock, and then you have it starts moving around, and of course. The, you know, the minute hand moves faster than the hour hand. Well, that's all the sun and moon are. So the moment he created them, he basically you have a, this electric clock and you plug it in. Boom. That's what happened in Genesis 1, 1, and 2. You plugged in and they're now moving. You just can't see them. Well, some clocks now you have the ability to illuminate or not illuminate. If you don't like it shining in the eyes all night long, you can disilluminate them or make them dim or whatever. Same thing. They just were not illuminated. Boom. He lit them on the first day of the week, the work week. And from that point on, we've had illuminated sky. Well, guess what? In order for new moon to work now, it would have had to work the same exact way on the very first month. Simple as that. So Troy, would you, would you say or believe or agree with the fact that any calendar that's a Sunday to sand Saturday is man's calendar, not Yahuwah's calendar? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and uh, the way you got to that point is the original pagan planetary week was Saturday. Sunday, Moon Day, Mars Day, Mercury's Day, Jupiter's Day, Venus Day. That was the original calendar. That was the pagan planetary week that um, the Roman centurions, the soldiers, brought back with them when they were done conquering the world. <clears throat> and for some time, I think it was um, about 200, 250 years, um, Rome was content to, they didn't care that they had another calendar in out there that the people were observing. You can read it historically, they had two calendars. There was one the people were keeping and they had their official calendar and that was called the Roman Republican calendar, which was an eight day week. A, B, excuse me, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. I have a picture of it if you'd like to see it. It's an eight day market week, not seven. So, the, but the pagan planetary week was the one that they brought, it was uh, the uh, per, uh, uh, Mithraism. It was the Persian version of the sun. It was their calendar. So they brought back the Persian calendar, if you will. And they liked this seven day planetary week. So the people, the commoners were keeping that. Well, eventually they, Rome decided to consolidate. So it was in 321 AD that Constantine said, okay, we're going to no more Roman Republican week, no more eight day week. We're all gonna have the seven day week, but they worship the sun, they worship Mithra. The Persian version of the sun god, which, and by the way, the papacy still worships Mithra. All the little symbols and all the pictures of, you know, the little halos around people and the Jupiter and, you know, they renamed Jupiter's cal uh, statue at St. Peter and now the masses go and they've kissed the toes off of Jupiter thinking it's Peter. It's all paganism, every bit of it. Well, anyway, this calendar, they, it was Saturday, Sunday, Moon Day, Mars Day, Mercury's Day, Jupiter Day, Venus Day. The reason why Saturday was the first day of the week is because the everybody, the other gods and the people were terrified of Saturn. 
because I mean, he ate his own children. He killed his own brother. Um, unspeakable horrors happened if you messed with Saturn. So they said, okay, we're gonna honor him first. They were terrified. So you're first, you're the, you're the supreme deity. So they honored him first. That's how Saturday became the first day of the pagan planetary week. Well, Constantine could care less about Saturn. They worshiped the sun, that was their God. So all he did was he said, okay, here's Saturday. That's the first day of the week. Here's Sunday, the second day of the week. All he said was boop. And then Saturday had to run down here to the end of the week. It's still the same exact cycle. If you look at it, it's still now it's Sunday, moon day, Mars day, Jupiter's day, or Mercury's day, Jupiter's day, Venus day, Saturday. It's still the same seven day cycle. It's just you had one and one, one will used to be two, everything moved up, you know, two through six moved up one day, Saturday ran to the end of the week, but it's still the same cycle, because you could still start down here with Saturday, the next day after that was Sunday, so all they did was shift the week, so it began with Sunday, that's how Sunday became the first day of the week, it was from Constantine, it has absolutely nothing to do with the Heavenly Father's calendar, it has nothing to do with the Hebrew calendar, and people who say, oh, Saturday's been the Sabbath since creation, guess what, you can count backwards from today, one, two, three, four, or I can't do the week backwards. Seven six five four three two one seven six five four three two one. You can count backwards all you want, but in three twenty one A.D., your count's going to blow up because at that point, Saturday was the first day of the week, not the seventh. I'm sorry, history don't lie. It's right there. It's it's been there forever. But Saturday Sabbath keepers have refused to look at it. Jews know it and don't admit it. Um, but that's the reason for the two separate calendars existing side by side. Uh, the the Jews and the Christians worship the pagan calendar the pagan i call it pagan papal calendar and that they, that's right. the one they worship by the rome ruled the world and whoever rules the world basically controls the calendar whoever's in charge is in charge of the calendar the calendar that you keep tells the heaven and the onlooking universe who or excuse me the calendar the whoever's in charge tells you when to work and when to worship that's that's where the quote goes um so <clears throat> but when you worship tells heaven and the onlooking universe who you worship so getting the day right is that it's that serious so if you're going to keep a calendar and you're assuming you're going to worship the heavenly father then you darn sure better be looking to find out that you're keeping the calendar that the father established not just the one that you're used to because they they do not there's not one they don't share one second in common not one very good um, so your website, Troy, we send people there to learn the calendar and not just, they, they start observing it with us as a, as a matter of fact, because we're observing it every month. We're looking for the new moon and so on and so forth. We're sharing your, your email each month and we're teaching it. And we're in Hawaii, of course, and Bonnie is in Australia, just a couple of hours past <laughs> us, different right. day on man's uh, dateline, of course, right. but with your website, You've got so much information there to study PDF by PDF. And you also, towards the end of it, have your frequently asked questions, which mm -hmm. are awesome. And obviously they're the ones that many of us have, have heard and even had a, a, of our own questions. But can you tell us what is the purpose of the Hall of Shame? Because I know there's some <laughs> awesome information there. The Hall of Shame, I'm glad you asked this because I get people fuss at me all the time saying, well, of course, they use the wrong name. They say, well, you know, that doesn't sound like something Jesus would do. He said, love your enemies. Well, one, I don't look at these people as my enemies. I look at them as being ignorant. <laughs> that doesn't mean they're my enemies. You know, ignorance is something that can be fixed. All you have to do is add knowledge and ignorance goes away. I'm not calling these people stupid. They're ignorant. Those are two different words. Stupid. You can't fix stupid, but you can fix ignorance with knowledge. So I assume these people are capable of learning. The idea is if you're going to have a ministry and it's going to be public and you're going to come out and attack the lunar Sabbath, then somebody has to stand up for them because the heavenly father typically doesn't send a bolt of lightning to chisel an answer in their sidewalk or in their driveway saying you're wrong. I, I have not known him to do that. He could, but he chooses not to, I think because he chooses to use us as his tools. So if people call me a tool, <laughs> which kind of has a bad connotation in the modern vernacular, then, okay, I may not be the sharpest knife in the drawer, but as long as I'm a tool in the father's toolbox, I don't care. You know, you call me a tool if you want. Well, if the father can use me, he'll use me. Well, what I do is I use the knowledge that the father has given me to rebut every false assumption, every lie, every half truth that they have about the lunar Sabbath 
and I just put it in a written format. Now, I'll be honest with you, I have never once mailed my rebuttal to the person who wrote the original article. One, I typically don't know how to. Some of them actually do. I do know how to do it. I just haven't. And the reason why is I don't want to beat somebody up typically because if they're, well, we've already talked about it. If I prove they're wrong, they're just going to get mad. They're going to start fussing at me and or they're going to dig in their heels. And what I'm going to do is kind of by rubbing their nose in it, it'll basically or maybe force them to stay where they're at. I would almost rather somebody else that they know come along and say, you know, I think you're wrong about your position on the Lunar Sabbath because they don't know me. As far as they're concerned, I'm a thief trying to enter in through a window. I'm not a friend trying to enter into the door when I present this to them, when I rebut their, their falsehoods about the Lunar Sabbath. So I created the Hall of Shame and I named it that because what they're doing is shameful. They're, they're, many of them are even name users, they're feast keepers, not all of them. Some of them are Adventists um, who have the Sabbath truth or they believe they have the Sabbath truth, but it's wrong. Some of, some of them have even attacked me personally by name in their anti-Lunar Sabbath diatribe. So I don't feel offended by that. They don't know me. They don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. But the point is, is that somebody has to stand up and basically write down their sin, what they're doing. I, and because I, I'm not the righteous judge, I don't send it directly to them to rub their nose in it. If they find it accidentally, that's fine. I don't mind. But I do not rub their nose in it. This is a teaching tool for you guys because you're going to hear the same exact arguments that I'm hearing. And so the, the Hall of Shame is actually the biggest teaching tool on here because, I mean, I can teach you how to do the calendar. I can teach you when to go out and look at the moon. I can teach you what you're looking for. I can teach you uh, what time to look and when to look and where to look and teach you how to do it. But I can't, without the Hall of Shame, I couldn't teach you how to defend it. The, so the Hall of Shame serves a purpose in that now when somebody comes at you and says, you know, ain't no way, you're a fool, you're an idiot, you're this, you're that, whatever, um, it's Sabbath, so you've heard all the arguments, you know, goes all the way back to creation, blah, blah, blah. This, there's no new arg, nothing new under the sun. Most of these uh, rebuttals that I do, it, re it, I'm regurgitating the same thing over and over the same argument, over the same objection, over and over again. So please don't read all of those in the Hall of Shame because you'll, it, it will be very redundant, very tedious. However, if you know any of these individuals, either personally or, you know, because you follow their ministry on the internet or something, by all means, open and look at that. Or if it's an Adventist, you may not know him personally, but hey, I'm an Adventist. I want to see what he has to say. Uh, um, <clears throat> there's all kinds of, you know, very, very good information in here. Not everybody argues from the same position, from the same point. Some of them, like I said, are feast keepers. Some of them are, uh, there's a few Jews on here. There's a few uh, Hebrew roots guys. There's some that are just plain skeptics. Um, some that are a PhD. There's PhDs on here that I've rebutted. And it's kind of silly because I don't have any letters behind my name. And yet I know more about scripture than they do. So it, it's, it's, I, I think it's hilarious myself. I don't, um, I, but again, like I said, I do not rub their nose in it. Um, I make no bones about it. The only reason this is there, it's a teaching tool for you guys. So it's kind of like hearing a testimony in court by the first guy. And then the yeah. second guy comes along and cross examines. Exactly, exactly yeah. that. If you're going to read one side, you should, uh, if you're going to accuse me of all manner of evil, I should be able to defend myself. Absolutely. This is my day in court. I have a question. Please. So since you're saying about the 13th month, when do you believe that that was or is added? Um, okay, very easy. Uh, we talked about earlier about how the lunar uh, cycle is 11 days shorter than the solar cycle. So basically three years later, your Passover would be 33 days into the winter. Uh, mm -hmm. It will move toward closer to January, if you will, um, by comparison. Okay, I'm again comparing it on the, I'm superimposing the two calendars. So it'd be 33 days, it'd be out of February and late of, well, no, it'd still be in uh, mid-February, I guess, 33 days from about when Passover would take place. So that can't happen clearly. So what happens is when you add, are you asking when I would add a 13th month? Like currently, like do you oh, think where, it's where this are we year now? or do you think we have a couple years? Oh, okay. Um, let's see, when did we last? We did not add one this year. I think we did add one last year. I, I don't remember. I'd have to look at my, 
I've been kind of keeping a running tally, but it, I've only just recently started it. But this year, a lot of people wanted to add a 13th month and it actually put Passover in late April. I'm sorry, but the harvest, the barley harvest starts in Israel in mid-March to early April every year. It's the, the last 10 days or so of March, the first seven days of April. It always starts in that window because that's when it's ripe. Because that I don't know if you know this, but barley ripens due to light, right. not heat. So it can be a very hot, it can it can be very cold, it can be a late winter, it can be an early spring, it doesn't matter. It's the amount of light that shows up, and that's a matter, a matter of this, time. You guys, that's a, I told him the same thing, Troy. I, 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 you're, you're bringing another witness to this. It, it, okay. it, these plants are photosensitive. They that's respond right. to the light, and so it's that's about right. the light. So the, if it's about light, that means it can't move 30 days mm -hmm. because that's not how it works. So it again, and Mrs. White, by the way, says this. She at three different places, she says, and not, I know not everybody on here is an Adventist, but for those of you who are, this would be a great comfort to you. Basically, she says, she says Passover is always in late March, early April, not the new moon that starts the first month, Passover is in late March. Well, how can Passover be in late March if the equinox is the 20 or 21st? There's not 14 days left in March from 20 or 21. So that what that means is that the new moon that begins the year can actually occur before the spring equinox. In fact, it can, it's Passover that has to be after the spring equinox. This is my, I, I can't prove this, but this is my opinion. Based on uh, <coughs> history, based on what Ellen White said, and based on um, his, uh, anecdotal evidence, I guess is what I would like to say. Because scripture is not very clear about, well, it, I can prove that there was a 13th month in scripture. It's in, found in Ezekiel. But the, the father doesn't remember the 13th month is something that man had to come up with in order to continue to keep the, the lunar solar calendar. So it's never it's not legislated in scripture. It's not found in there. But I can I can prove that they understood it and were doing it uh, based on a passage in Ezekiel. But anyway, um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, the, the 13th month is <clears throat> it basically Passover. If you get, if the, the, the 12th month ends and when it ends, there's more than 14 days to the equinox, 14 days or more, then you would add a 13th month. And see, and I think okay. this is why Judah has been doing this 13th, you know, 8R2 is, is because, I mean, they literally have to reconcile that way. Yeah. It, it, but but if, the you, whole, if you get the whole a concept right. At the right time, at the equinox, you get it right, and you don't. And okay, so it's the equinox. Uh, it's the the new moon, the closest to, not exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's the new moon closest to the equinox. That is when the year begins, and that's the only way that Mrs. White, what she said, makes any sense because she said Passover is in late March right. or early April. Yep. Every year, Passover is in late March to early April. Well, I'm sorry, but there's not 14 days after the equinox. So that means in order for Passover to be on the 31st of April, that means that the new moon had to have taken place before the equinox. Exactly. And guess what? That's exactly when barley is ripe in Israel. Every year I've been, I scour the internet about new moon or about the first month looking and I predict it. You've seen, if you're on my newsletter, you've seen me yeah. predict it because I found people that are already saying, hey, we found it. They show pictures of it. They, they document. There's all kinds of Hebrew roots movement of the, the Jews, think the wannabes, whatever you want to call them, peacekeepers, Christians, whatever they go, they flock from, from America, flock to Israel every year trying to find that first handful for their ministry, you know, whatever ministry they're supporting or whatever, whoever ministry is paying for their trip over there whatever it is. Well, every year they find barley about eighth, ninth, sixth day, eighth, seventh day, 10th day, 14th day, right? I mean, it's in early March when they're actually finding it. Well, guess what? That means that the next new moon or the one that's already happened, as long as Passover is after the equinox, 
that that barley counts. And if you add a 13th month, which is what a lot of people did this year. I'm about to say that. They add a 13th month. Guess what? The barley harvest, they found barley, I think, on the 9th of March this year. And people, a lot of people, a lot of Lunar Sabbath keepers, they added, I don't know why. I have not the slightest clue why, but they added a 13th month and they kept it six weeks after the barley harvest started in Israel. No people who did. What? And there's a whole nother Hebrew group who don't observe. They observed, observed the Saturday thing and the same mm -hmm. kind of thing happened to them. They added to add a, a 13th month. They're just, they're right now are, are just coming off of. Uh, yeah. Just now coming oh, off tabernacles. Yeah. Yeah. They kept, they kept the tabernacle. And, and I want to ask you something. Tabernacles is the feast of final harvest is one of the ways it's. I, I also again. brought this up. Because that's already taking place. The wheat, yeah. the wheat is harvested what? early, early um, summer and summer, late summer. Yeah. And yeah. when that's done, we're done. Yeah. You, if you're going to keep the fish, you have to keep them in the time frame of the harvest of in the Israel. Harvest. Thank you, brother. And Another witness. Look, look at the look at don't look at the calendar. Look at your local farmer or your farmer's market. I just went to the farmer's market just this weekend, and there was nobody there. I was going to buy eggs and some greens if they still had them. There was nobody there. Guess what? There's nothing being harvested right now. Why on earth would this be the month of the Feast of Final Harvest? There was nobody there. Where's all the where's all the final the produce that people would have had? This is that actually, happened last month. This is actually planting season, brother. They're planting yeah, wheat right now. Right, yeah, they're planting the, the winter wheat right now. That's exactly right. It's planting season. You're exactly right. And I posed the same argument or, or, or questions, rhetorical question of how could this be because you we can't escape the the fact that these harvests and feasts are interconnected we can't separate the two no you can't you can't i mean the feasts have to align with the harvests and ha having your feast of final harvest a month after the final harvest makes no sense if and you're it not was, paying attention to barley and you're not paying attention to wheat and you're just you, mixing this thing into a you are completely off yeah if you blow the first month if you add a 13th month or don't add a 13th month when you should you're a month off you're either a month early or a month late exactly right. and it's not rocket science anybody i mean in this era anybody can look on the internet and see when barley's going in israel they're not there's not some missing disinformation campaign going on people are i mean like i said there are ministries that pay people to go over there and do this for them because they they all can't go so they find an emissary that wants to go they pay their trip over there and they're out there looking for for right barley yep. i mean and dozens of them are doing it maybe even hundreds of them are doing it and they post their findings on the internet guess what they're not trying to disinform people they're trying to inform people right so uh, i typically every year i'll find three witnesses that says here's the barley and guess what it's always in you know late or excuse me early to middle uh, March when they find it because Passover is always in late March or early April. Daniel, you got a question? I see your hands up, Daniel. Oh, oh sorry to speed my animals. Um, uh, so basically, okay, I'm a little just I'm a little confused. So there is a 13th month, and just right every now and again, every two to three years, you add a 13th month. I uh, and um just from what it seems like to me, it's it's a, sort of like. A man-made thing that we made in order to sort of keep up with Yah. After it is. Sort of his clock sort of. Right after he dented his calendar. Um, yeah, I mean, I give him credit for it. So after the calendar changed, then Israel found a way to continue to keep the feast and, and at the right time. And the only way to do that was to add a thirteenth month. So. All right, I'm gonna have to keep an eye out for that then and uh, learn more about it. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, if I don't know, are you a lunar Sabbath keeper? Yes. Okay, I don't know if you're on my on my newsletter list, but every month I send out a newsletter, and if there are any feasts, I'll announce them, and I announce the days, you know, when new moon takes place. Based, I mean, I tell you when to look, what to look for, and uh, what time to look. Uh, I guess I did say that when, when, where, and what to look for. Um, and the first year, I will always give you the three, at least three witnesses, two or three witnesses showing you can go there and click them for yourself and see that there's somebody over there saying hey i found right barley and it's always in you know like march 6th to march 14th somewhere in there when they find it meaning that the month is going to start shortly after that because you know you have to have that first fruit offering so if you wait a month and the barley's already fallen on the ground and if you start too early then you have no first fruit so it's simple as that in order to keep passover in line with the harvest the barley harvest you have to do it 
when the barley says so, not when you think so, or not when your calendar you think so, or not when your pastor, your rabbi says oh, so. Yeah, yeah. Keep it. You try to do it with plants, you ain't gonna get nowhere. Exactly. I'm good question, thankful. Daniel. I'm yeah, so thankful. Thank you for that. Um, Got the witness. Is that on your website? You said I could contact you. Uh, like just, email just or whatever. Get in touch with me and get on the newsletter list. Um, my my email address is admin a d m i n at creationcalendar.com. And just let me say, hey, I, I heard you on the, you know, code searcher, code breakers, whatever you guys are. I don't forgotten your name. Sorry. <laughs> you know, whatever it was, That's I saw you on the video. I, I like to be on the newsletter. Just let me know. Um, if you're not a Lunar Sabbath keeper, then that information might bore you to tears. But if you are a Lunar Sabbath keeper, especially a new Lunar Sabbath keeper, the information there is absolutely fantastic because it'll teach you when to go out and look for the moon, what you're looking for and where to look, which direction to look. And if you will do that, I mean, sometimes we can't see it because we've got cloud cover, but if you'll do that consistently, I mean, eventually you'll see the entire lunar cycle. It may not be on this, you know, one 30 day stretch, but eventually you see the entire lunar cycle and you see how the clock oh, works. You start to sort of put it together in your head and get a concept yeah. of it going. Exactly. And I've been doing this for over 20 years now. So I've, I've, I've worked through the kinks. I mean, there's some times when one phase will be out of sync with the other phases. Like this month is the perfect example. The first week, it looked like the Sabbath was announced on Wednesday, but all the new moon and all the other phases lined up for Thursday. How'd that happen? Well, it's very simple. The moon is no longer in a perfectly circular orbit. It's now on an egg-shaped orbit. And it, <clears throat> when this, the phase of the moon is in the, the skinny part of the egg, it may whip through there that, <clears throat> that seven-day cycle quicker so you might be a little bit day late or if it's in the bottom of the egg when it's wider it takes slower to get through there so you might be a day early so it just depends on where the moon is in that cycle oh, that's gonna feel like it's, a, it's turning the curve like a racetrack or something exactly exactly so it whips if it's a sharp corner you whip through it quicker than you would in the longer one so it depends and the moon is not always in a place where it throws one phase like it's out of sync Right. The beautiful, the beautiful thing about this is when it does appear that the phase is out of sync, like it's like a little bit skinny or a little bit fat, um, it's usually in the right place because a clock is not just about appearance; it's also about position. You know, this is three o'clock, right? Yeah. I'm just well, like that. How's that better? You have know, twelve o'clock and three o'clock. That's position. Okay, appearance would be there's a twelve and there's a three. So. You have to understand that it's not always about position. Sometimes appearance, by and large, they're almost always the same. The appearance and position is perfect. But there are times when one of them will appear to one of the phases, it's usually four to six months out of the year, um, one of the phases will seem out of sync with the others. It's not something to panic about. You're still counting one, two, three, four, five, six, Sabbath, you know? And uh, <coughs> so it, you don't have to, to let that, I mean, a lot of people get wrapped around the axle about that. I try to tell people, don't get wrapped around the axle about that because when the appearance it looks wrong, the position is probably correct. So, so, so it might be a, it might be a skinny moon or a fat moon, but it'll be in the you know in the right place. Sophia, you still got a question? I see your hands up. I was going to ask Terry's question for her. Her question was, where do you feel like we are in the cycle of Nibiru, the return, the chaos of the planetary bodies? Is this going to happen again? I think so. <laughs> I don't know where we are in the cycle because I've not been around it when it happened before or the time before that. So I really don't know how many years apart they are. I know there's some people that, that have a better guesstimation than that. But here's the deal. I am convinced that the father's going to correct the calendar and put it back because once he does he, when he puts it back on a 360 day cycle where we'll the see. lunar and the solar cycle is perfect then it will blow up every man-made calendar out there one two three four five six seven is no longer going to work so i mean i i am convinced that the father has a sense of humor i'm absolutely convinced i mean he chose me to be maybe the mouthpiece for the creation calendar movement so he has to have a sense of humor so I just, I, I, that would be poetic justice for all the naysayers that are out there, all the people that are giving you grief about you keeping the lunar Sabbath. If he had another flyby and whatever, whatever happened to move things apart, if it puts them back together again, well, you know, the calendar is going to be the same in the new earth because it says from new, one new moon to another, one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith Yah. Yeah. So it, it, why would the father continue on a, on a, 
well, I don't want to call it corrupt, but on a dented calendar. He wouldn't. It would go back to the original. Yeah. It would go back to the perfect, which is what it was at creation. So yes, I absolutely believe that we may have, I don't know that it'll be life-threatening. I don't know. That the, I don't think anybody died the last time it came by. The, the, the pagans were watching it and they were recording what they saw and they, ah, their gods were fighting. You know, I think that we'll see it. I think we'll know what's happening, but I don't think it'll be life-threatening. I know a lot of people believe it's going to come so close that it'll, you know, have tidal waves and kill half I mean, the population. It looks, it looks, it appears in, in what we're looking in the encoded text. And by the way, that Judah just, <laughs> I've, I wondered where this, where this word came from and why we were seeing it in the text because it's pagan. And I would attribute it to the secular world, but not to Christians, not going to call wormwood or planted right. eggs. Nibiru is right. going to be the secular world. But right. as it were, brother, we begin to see rabbis searching codes and looking for planet seven X and, and planet mm -hmm. X and Nibiru. And they started looking at it more and more. Well, a really convincing code that, that's found in a place talking about the star of Jacob appearing, <clears throat> right? in the end of days and nibiru is is connected it's it's sharing letters it's it comes together like this in the text in a very small place 39 is the width of that cylinder so we're talking about you know the equivalent to the yeshua code in in isaiah 53 very small text the, the mathematics or, or the um, statistics on that is in the billions this is an accident right so we're talking about something that doesn't happen just Randomly, this is not an accident that Nibiru and end of days comes together in a place talking about a sign appearing in the heavens, about a star appearing, right? That's not, a, that's not an accident. He was telling us something there. So Judah right. began to call this thing Nibiru. Before that, in the text in the Talmud, you know, and in the Zohar, they have prophecies about the star that's going to appear. They didn't have a name for it until we found it in the codes, uh, Troy. And since huh. that, they've been calling this star that's going to appear Nibiru. Hmm. But yeah, in the Talmud or in the Zohar, anytime one of the rabbis were or, or one of their sages were prophesying about this this um, sign that's going to appear in the heavens, and it's a whole system. When you when you go and look at it, it's like seven stars actually, but right. it's a, one system. Right. They didn't There's have a, a cluster of them. Yeah, they There's didn't have a name for it, and right. so they just left it like that. But now with the codes. You can see from YouTube videos, the rabbis are actually <laughs> seeing that word Nibiru in there. And it's right. like, well, there you go. It's not the secular world. It's actually Judah that's going to tag this thing as Nibiru. And I do think we're going to see effects of it. We may see the, the arrangement of, you know, the clock going back to the way it was. And we'll start seeing the changes because things are not, you know, we're looking for the new moon and it's not adding up, right? Something like that. I don't know. It may be very blatant it may be like we see this thing parked right next to us i don't know i'm speculating here but i do believe it's it's a game changer and things go back to the way it was the whole world's not going to be destroyed you guys it's going to be baptized in fire so that plasma discharge the very same thing we saw happen with the comet and mars when they came together there was a plasma discharge that happened mars lit up like a light bulb with sighting spring so you know, we're talking about, you know, things that we, we never can imagine or keep, can even imagine ourselves in, right? But the word says it's going to happen. There's going to be things that fall from the heavens, these stones, right. right? So obviously we're getting pelted by meteorites or something like that. But, um, you know, we serve in Elohim is very strategic, right? 10,000 to your left and 1,000 by your right. Not a hair on your head is going to be harmed. So it's very strategic. And it is the wicked that's removed. It's not, it's not us. All right. Anyway, you guys got any more questions for Troy before we, um, we've, we've kept him a good long time. <laughs> we sure appreciate your time today, Troy. Yeah, and thank I, you so much for your time. It's been such a blessing. I have actually had a very good time. I've been, I've been very blessed. Thank you for asking. Thank yeah. you so much, Troy. You've been so yeah. gracious and so accommodating. Thank you very much. I have, I, this for like another week. <laughs> I, have, yeah, I have tried to answer a few questions over here and I don't, I hit, I'm typing where I think I'm supposed to type and I hit enter or, and I never see what I type come up. So I don't know if anybody has seen my answers to their questions. <laughs> you guys, Darla, you got any more questions? You want to field any more of those? Uh, I don't really see anything else, but I, I do want to uh, 
acknowledge that I do believe that Troy was sent to us by the father to, to restore this calendar to the earth and to his people. And um, even though we don't see a lot of his videos on YouTube and it's not like Friday's the Wednesday video or Wednesday's a Wednesday video and Friday's the Friday day video, like a lot of teachers, um, Troy, most of Troy's work is, is I don't writing. know how. I don't know yeah, how to do it. Most of, of your work is in writing. So it's just, it's a, it's a hidden treasure, your website to, to go to for people who want to study on the calendar. It's just, you're not going to see so many videos, but we would love to have you on here and give you a platform, Troy. Just let I'd us know. I would, I'll be happy to come back. I talked to Terry about the logistics of that and she can talk to you about that. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know that I could do it on a regular basis, but I could certainly do it on a semi-regular basis or, or sure. irregular. <laughs> we would but, love to uh, have you because we want to be able to give you, if, if, we can, if we can help give you a platform to get a visual of, of these answers, because a lot of people don't want to study something written. Trust me, I know. Right. <laughs> um, right. But, uh, you know, yeah. the, the information is, is so powerful. If we can get it in a video form that would be amazing right the day and age in which we live the video seems to be king and for whatever reason that technology has passed me by i've been on skype i think once i think this is i'm pretty sure this is my first zoom call that i've ever done wow you know i don't i don't know maybe i don't need these I, you know i just assumed i did but maybe i don't so um i do have a, a mic i think on the computer i don't know if it works as well as the you know the little one right here in front of me but anyway it's great and you know we've talked with you before it just hasn't happened yet so we're thrilled right. we're thrilled to finally see um us all come together and like your your calendar understanding is being taught in the code searcher school and as far and wide as we can share it on jonathan's well, thank youtube you. channel um thank you so well, thank you because obviously you as you said you who would chose you and so we are thrilled we're thrilled you've been doing this for 20 years that your wife first said, why are we doing this? On this? <laughs> yeah. I did have a question actually. Um, sure. And I think that this is important. I think it's important for people to understand the day does not begin in the evening. That's part mm. of understanding this calendar. Can uh -huh. you speak toward that? Sure. Um, we'll go right back to Genesis, if you don't mind. Genesis 1, 5, I believe it says, and the light he called day and the darkness he called night. So why on Yah's green earth would anybody start their day when night begins? Why would anybody start their day in the middle of, you know, like midnight, in the middle of the night and going, you know, uh, the day is the lit part. The night is the dark part. It's right there in Genesis. I mean, the, in the first, you know, few, few first hundred words in Genesis, it flat out says that the lit part the heavenly father, not me, the heavenly father called the lit part day and the dark part he called night. So when does the lit part begin? Dawn. When does the dark part begin? Evening. Uh, read up a verse. It says that he divided the day from the night. Day and night don't touch. Evening and morning are the dividers. Evening is not night. Morning is not day. A lot of people, Adventists especially, will say, oh, yeah, the, the morning is, that's talking about the daytime, and the evening is the nighttime. That's why when it says evening in the morning, it's saying night and then day. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> it's a creation event, and it's a timeline. It said, okay, time begins. Okay, the Heavenly Father um, and said, let there be light, and there was light. Time begins. Tick, 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 we have this, what you would call a 12 hour day. And then Heavenly Father says, and there was evening. Tick, 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 tick. And later still, there was morning, day one. There's a, uh, I think it's a letter M uh, in Hebrew. I don't mean, is it called a mem, meme? Yes. Um, that's yes. in there. And it, I think when they use just a single letter, it's an and. It's actually in, the, there's no letter or there's no word and but when they use a letter a single letter it indicates an and well guess what and is a connective word it is in hebrew it is in english so if i say and troy well what came first jonathan and troy now i have connected i've used that and in the middle to connect two things 
Well, it says, and there was evening. What's it, what was it connected to? When the father has created light. <laughs> That's what it's saying. Day, he calls it day and night. Day happened. Tick, 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 tick. Time began. And there was an evening. Tick, 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 tick. And later still, there's a morning. Day one. So if day two begins when day one ends, when did day two begin? At dawn. Because it says evening and morning was day one. So right here is when day two begins. Guess what? That's morning. So now you take off of here and you have another creation event where he created the firmament. Let me move it over here. So now he creates the firmament and he, notice he doesn't see the firmament. Even the father can't see nothing. The firmament is nothing. It's he creates an empty space between heaven and earth. <laughs> so uh, all the other creation events, he said that the father saw the light and it was good, or he saw the fish and the birds and it was good. He didn't say that for the second day because even the father can't see nothing. So anyway, so we have this event it says after he created the firmament and there's evening, tick, 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 and there's morning, day two. Well, when day two ends is when day three begins. Guess what? Day three begins at morning it's not rocket science you just have to look right there in english for well hebrew and english right there in genesis one the day can't begin anywhere other than dawn because the father right. says the lit part's called day the dark part's called night evening and morning are the dividers so you have day here you have night here so this the segment in between where they don't touch is called morning okay the, or excuse me evening if this is day this is is night then this thing in the middle is called evening. And so you have light slowly mixing with darkness until it's fully night. Same thing, just the opposite. Now, if this is night and this is day, this segment in the middle is called morning. Once night ends and light starts, you have an ever increasing mixture of darkness with light until it is fully light and it's no longer dark. That's the moment the sun breaks the horizon. That is the end. From here to here, this point to this point is called morning. It's when light starts on the horizon, but the moment the sun breaks the horizon, it's day. You have a, a, a divider, as the father flat out said, and he's going to divide the day from the night. They don't touch. And the dividers are evening and morning. Daybreak. Daybreak, dawn. Yeah. yeah. Uh, somebody had a question here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Still have questions about the Passover week and the resurrection week. Okay. Can you speak to that, Troy? Uh, what specifically is the question? Are they talking about Friday, uh, Saturday, Sunday? I think, I think that's the I think that's the point. Probably. Now. That's usually yeah. the question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't keep okay, well, a comment real quick on what you just said. Is that okay? Par pardon? Comment on what you just said real quick. Sure. It's it's amazing how simple it is. It, it's literally, it's beyond common sense. It's literally part of our nature. If you were to literally ask anybody. You go outside, ask anybody. When's day? Oh, daytime. Sun. When's night? Night. It's only when we try to like overthink it that we get more complicated and get these other false things. Right. It's just it, it's ingrained in our nature, literally. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. And I'm trying to find a place. Well, I can't. I was trying to find a study. If I had known ahead of time what your question was going to be, I would have brought up a little list so I could have read it. I don't have it at my fingertips, but. The lunar cycle is calculatable. I don't, is that a word? <laughs> it's can, is able to be calculated. That's the same thing. It's calculatable, right? Uh, to the second. And so you can count the, you go backwards in time with the lunar cycle back to the, the era in which the crucifixion took place. And if you take the current weekly cycle, you know, uh, Saturday sun, or Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, if you, transport translate that back you know count backwards using the gregorian calendar to which wasn't being used in the first century mind you but if you extrapolate that back to the time of the crucifixion i have done this i have a lunar phase calculator so i can type in the year of 27 ad 28 29 30 31 32 33 i did that 27 through 33 because that covers all the years that all the different scholars think that the uh, crucifixion took place. Adventists have picked 31 AD as the date, but there are some who pick, in fact, the, the three dates that are the mo most commonly accepted are 30, 31, and 33 AD. Adventists chose 31, but I expanded that. I went to 27 AD all the way to 33 AD. 
and I looked at the lunar cycle. Well, guess what? I know that the full moon takes place at Passover, right? I mean, Passover day, you have a full moon that night, announcing the next day is the second Sabbath of the first month. So I went back to 27, 28, 29, 30, and 31, 32, and 33, and looking for to see if there was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday crucifixion weekend, you know, around 14, 15, 16, you know, the Passover time. There isn't one. So you can take the current calendar and extrapolate it back in time, and there's not a single year in all of the accepted years when the crucifixion could have taken place that produces a Friday, Saturday, Sunday crucifixion weekend, not one. I think that that is, again, the Heavenly Father foreknowing all the garbage and all the arguments and all the counterfeit garbage that's going to be presented by either the adversary or pretenders you know, to the throne. There's a lot of people that are hanging on to Israel, but that truly aren't trying to be Israel. They're just hangers on. And they may, they may as well be boogers on the body of believers, as far as I'm concerned, because they aren't, they aren't, they aren't doing a thing for the body of believers and they truly need to just be picked and flicked, gotten rid of. But yeah. anyway, that's basically what these people are, the, the function they serve. So people and, talk about the three days and the three nights. Okay. Okay. Three days that's and three really nights. Sure. That's, 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 that's a, that's a different, um, I have a study. It's a, not a lengthy study, but I do have a study on that. If you want to add, just say three days, three nights in your, either in the subject line or in the body of your text and ask for the study in a nutshell, when he says in the, in the heart of the earth, because he says three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, that heart of the earth is actually a Hebrew idiom. You find it all throughout the Old Testament, but only in the New Old Testament, they translate it in the midst of the earth. And basically it means in the middle of the earth is what that Hebrew idiom means. And all the way back in Genesis, the very first place that that phrase midst of the earth is used, I think it's the heavenly father talking to Jacob, but I could be wrong. Um, I've forgotten that some of those details, but anyway, the heavenly father is talking about the land of Israel. So in my opinion, scripture is its own dictionary. So all you have to do is look for the, a word that you're trying to define and you look for the very first time it's used, and that will set the definition for the rest of the times that you'll use it throughout scripture. You can do that with the Sabbath, Yom. We just did that with Yom. It means heat. Well, wait a minute. How can you have a, a heat from the sun on the first day of creation week if the sun wasn't invented or created until the eighth or the fourth day? You know, so when you look at that, then it's like, okay, in the Hebrew, we have a problem because that word means heat from the sun. And this, that means the sun could not have been, been invented or created on the fourth day. So that's the reason why I, the information I just gave with you a little bit ago. So um, you do the same thing with this midst of the earth or heart of the earth. And it literally means the land of Israel for three days and three nights. So, so was that prophetic? Was it, I mean, like, because if you say no, it couldn't have been. Because if you say three days, then it could have been three years. Because in when you're doing the day day for a year thing, it's all you never say if you say day and night, you're talking about a literal 24 hour period. That's why it said when it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. If you had told a Hebrew, oh, it rained for 40 days, that meant that it started raining night, during the day and stopped raining at night. Started raining the second day, stopped raining at night. Started raining the third day, rained all day, didn't stop raining at night. That's what it would have meant to a Hebrew. So if they're talking about a 24 hour period, they'd say day and night or evening and morning. So that's, that's the way a Hebrew, their Hebrew idioms, that's the way they would talk about a 24-hour cycle. Well, if they say day and night, then that's literal time. That's not prophetic time. Prophetic time, he'd said three days. So this is literal time. So um, I have, this is Troy Muller's opinion. If Yahushua was the Passover lamb, <clears throat> then he would have had to have been selected on the 10th day of the month, because that's when Israel would have gone to pick their lamb up and investigate it for uh, uh, disabilities <laughs> or defects. Blemishes. The, huh? Blemishes. Right. Blemishes. Thank you. Perfect one. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that, if you look at the what Pilate is doing, three times. He says, I find no fault with him. Oh. So was that three? Why would he have said that like five minutes apart? Wow. I think 
I think that he was not taken on the evening of Passover. And the reason I think that is because he could not have been the Passover lamb unless he was taken on the 10th, which would have meant three days and three nights that he would have been investigated then killed on the fourth day, which would have been the 14th. 13th, yeah, I, yeah. well, from 10th to 11th is one day, 11 to 12 is two, 12 to 13 is three days. Then he was killed on the on the 14th. So that is the only explanation. This is again Troy Miller speculating. I'm not trying to say this mm -hmm. is the gospel. I'm just saying that that is the only mathematical solution to this three days and three nights because heart of the earth or midst of the earth does not mean grave anywhere. It is never once, not once, New Testament, Old Testament, or any other writings where that phrase is used to indicate grave. He could have said Tartarus. He could have said Hades. He could have said the abyss. He could have said hell he could have said the pit he could have said any number of known hebrew phrases talking about in the grave if that's what he meant i don't think he meant that i don't he wasn't if if you're going to look at hebrew idioms and chase it back to the beginning and if the first time it meant land of israel well then guess what when the, when he was using it in the new testament it would have meant the land of israel too to his listeners and they would have recognized and basically i think he was a prisoner in the land of Israel for those three days. And that's what I think that means. And that study that I have on that, if you wanna ask for it again, this a lot, a lot of that study, well, some of that study is based on scripture. It's not all just speculation, but the, the conclusion I just gave you is me speculating that he was taken on the 10th, not the 14th. And the reason I say that is because three times Pilate said, I find no fault with him. There's no reason for him to say that all three times in one day. I think that he had examined him, questioned him, quizzed him for a day. Then he came out and announced his findings. I find no fault with him. Next day, I think the same thing. Because remember, they were looking for faults. They're looking for blemishes. Well, Israel wasn't. They were letting Pilate do it. So that that's Troy Miller speculating what that all meant. Yeah, that, um, sorry to interrupt you. That kind of makes sense. They'd be like police interrogating someone. Yeah, exactly. Or holding someone for questioning, in a sense, for a longer period of time. Exactly. Pilot was doing the investigating, looking for blemishes. That's fascinating. That would be great for you to add to that study, I think, because that's the first time I've heard you say that. So well, it's it's in the, it's it's in a study I have. It's just ask say ask for it three days, three nights, and I'll I'll email. Yeah, it to I've you. got the three days, three nights. I I just don't recall you talking about him being taken on the tenth to be examined. Uh, okay, you're right. I think in the study I put what that means is open to. Um, investigation or open to discussion. I right, think, exactly. I Kinda think that's what I put in there. Yeah, I just filled maybe in the this, blanks. Is this new revelation to you, or is this something a new thought for you? No, I, okay. I've been looking at this for some time. Uh, the reason why is because, the, well, one, the Friday, Saturday, Sunday crucifixion issue. A lot of people yeah. try to say that's what he was talking about with that three days. Sure. And when the problem is, is he wasn't in the grave for three days he was barely in it for 18 and 24 hours if you look right. at the time frame so what was he talking about so again when i was disproving the saturday or friday saturday sunday routine i basically blew up the whole three day three night concept that i had been taught so i'm like right. hmm, well what does that mean well that's the way i find all kinds of stuff is i disprove something in my own mind and i find out what it's really talking about and then it opens another can of worms that i didn't have to go and study something else out Right. So, but again, there's always harmony in the truth. You never have to worry about investigating anything that you think you believe because there's always harmony in the truth. Trisha has a question. She's patiently had her hand up there. Um, thank you. Actually, <laughs> you just sparked a question. My other comment was, is I've had my mind blown so many times today <laughs> oh, just I'm... for, I'm one of those people that Darla talks about that the, the, the visual hearing your voice helps me to process so okay. I can't wait until Jonathan posts this um, on the <laughs> channel so that I can reprocess. But I just wanted to thank you so much. Um, You're very welcome. So the, what you just now said of the 18 or hours, it's not three days, three nights, no. according to, solves for me the first fruits feast that isn't three days or three nights after Passover. That's right. Does that make it sense? It's the first fruits is the 16th. It's always the 16th day of the exactly. month. So it can't mm -hmm. be, you, he can't be the first fruits from the dead if he's the Passover and then three days later, because that's not when first fruits happens. And you're right. Oh, perfect. Well, that's so 
comforting to me. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. You no, know, I just wanted to say thank you. And I would <laughs> love for um, us to be, I just um, emailed you and asked to be put on the newsletter list. I've only been okay. doing the calendar now for about a year. Okay. Even though Darla told me about it like almost eight, nine years ago. But um, just, just want to thank you. I mean, you've clarified for me so many things that are now going to enable me to share more effectively with other people. And I think Absolutely. the whole outside sources and that's why I need to process it again. I need to listen to you again. So thank okay. you so much. You're very welcome. The one thing I'd like to say commenting on the newsletter is it's kind of a cheat sheet, um, especially for new people who are new at it. I mean, there's people that are on the newsletter list that have been a Lunar Sabbath keeper for almost as long as I do. And I'm sure they don't need the newsletter, but they haven't asked to take their name off. So I still send, they might just delete it. They might not read it. But the point is, is that it's, it's a wonderful teaching tool for somebody who's new, because like I said, it'll tell you where to look and what to look for and when to look for it. And for those of you who are in the Southern hemisphere, instead of looking, the only difference is instead of looking to the South, you'll look North. Everybody in the Northern Hemisphere needs to find a place where they know where due south is and look south and then look left and right for the moon because it'll be on the sky's dome over your head. Those of you who are in the Southern Hemisphere, all you have to do is turn north, and do the same thing and look for the moon because you'll be looking at the same moon at the same time. It's, it's really simple. So the, please, by all means, the newsletter is, is, is like, it's like a cheat sheet. You, it takes all the guesswork out of it. I've done all the guesswork already. I've, I've beat my head against the wall trying to figure it out. So basically, it tells, like I said, it tells you when to look, what to look for, and where, what does direction to be looking. And <clears throat> when you take all the, all that out of it, then weather, if it weather's in the way, okay, well, I missed it tonight. I'll just look tomorrow night. And pretty soon, you'll see the exact progression of the moon across the sky. You'll see what it's doing. You'll get a feel for, oh, that's what's going on. It takes all the guesswork out of it. Super cool. Thank you. So you don't have to calculate. You don't have to look, you know, or I'll try to meticulate or masticate or, you know, whatever you're, I mean, a lot of people look through all kinds of things trying to figure it out. And I tell them, <laughs> you know, it takes all the good. I mean, it, some people want to do the work and figure it out for themselves. And that's great if that's the way you learn. But if you're just a visual learner, like I am, go out and look at the moon. But if you don't know when to look, you'll confuse yourself. If you know when to look, then you'll get the exact feel for the clock in the, in the, in the sevens. So if the newsletter is useful for that, then I, I would be tickled silly if that's the only thing people use it for. Well, and, and I would love if there's a, if somebody posted, yeah, we want all your studies, not just the three days, three nights. I was <laughs> well, like- they're yeah. all on the website. Exactly. Uh, I think even, even the three day, three night is on there someplace. Cool. So um, they're all on there. Um, but like I said, if you're just looking for something specific, by all means, just email me and request it. But it's all on the website. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Yeah, I'm still learning. But for me, my biggest problem is spotting it because it either be I live in Florida. So it can either be cloudy okay. or for some reason, yeah. lately, the issue I've had is it being on like too low on the horizon for me to see because, you know, just right. Light are you on the coast are you on the coast in florida yeah i'm on i'm in south florida. i'm like I'm, I'm like two miles from the coast from the beach okay Maybe. okay okay on the left coast or on the gulf coast <laughs> i'm on the east coast because <laughs> okay. i'm on like the western horizon and i'm like oh i uh can't really see it then the reason i'm asking is because i am from florida i'm native floridian in fact i just saw a meme the other day that says um i'm not a cracker i'm a saltine american <laughs> <laughs> Bonnie so just a, had an awesome idea. She says we need a uh, a Troy tab in Discord, a whole uh, yeah, a tab just for his your studies. Oh, we do I don't have know one what... on the new moon, uh, you guys. We have one on the restoring the new moon, and and Troy Miller's probably his his emails. We we post there every month, and his website we can post there we we definitely have a place that we can we can uh, have troy miller's website right there readily available awesome i don't i don't know what tab and discord means but that's okay you guys do so that's fine <laughs> it's one of the apps that we're we're using but we also have a website that we could probably okay. integrate darla somewhere integrate troy's stuff or or at least hyperlinks that'll take 
yeah, that's fine. The viewer to his stuff, you know, over there. You can just, instead of taking them to the website, just choose a specific study because each study has its own link. Yeah. So, and that way, if you have something that we can send them right to it, that'd be fine. Yeah, we exactly. could put something like that, you guys, where we where we have the hyperlinks exactly. and all laid out, and you just click on it, and it goes right to his stuff. Yes. And I don't want anybody to ever think that just, I mean, you guys have said some very nice things about me on this call, and I don't want anybody to think that I believe anything you said. I don't, I, I was talking earlier about these people, the clingers that on the, you know, one of the pretenders to the throne about being boogers on the body of believers. My personal opinion of myself is I'm the belly button lint on the body of believers. I'm not the eyes. I'm not the hands. I'm not the feet. I'm just the belly button lint. And as long as I'm a part of the body, I'm good with that. So, um, but anyway, I, I don't look at myself as being a leader. I don't look at myself as being special or chosen or anything. I think the father, the way I look at it is the father put a burden on my heart. And for whatever reason, he gave me the ability to, to write it in a concise manner to, to back it up with evidence and i don't know how i learned to put it on i I've, it's on the website right now somebody if i was asked to redesign my website i couldn't do it i don't i don't know that i <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how i did it the first time so anyway I, i'm nobody special that you should follow me i'm just a beggar that uh, is trying to show other beggars where they can find bread so well, we're just we're, we're thankful for your obedience to being willing to be the belly button lint. that i have been that I have been. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I'm thankful, I'm thankful your break from. that he used you. So um, because it's where a lot of us found that manna that, that, you know, that path to go and check down right. that confirmed a lot of things. So um, you've been, you've definitely been used by the father and um, we, we, we know you're humble brother and you're not out there pom pom and, and no, not. like that. We, right. that's very evident. By and large, I'm, I'm typically a second or third witness. Like you said, you found something and then you found my site that was saying the same thing. So you found yep. another witness. Yep. And by and large, that's mostly how it goes. For people very rarely find the Lunar Sabbath for me. A few have. They're, they're curious about it. And I'm like the first website that made sense to them. They might look at the other one that we talked about earlier. They might look at World's Last Chance and they like, eh, it's kind of confusing. And they find mine and it's like, ah, the light bulb goes on. You know, I get that a lot where they say, we appreciate what you've written because it's easy to understand in scripture. You know, and, and that's that's my whole goal. I, I, I want to take, I remember I told you how I take Troy Miller out. You know, it has a, a period or, <laughs> you know, all the pages line up. And it's absolutely astounding how many times I have edited something and then everything above it ends perfectly. I didn't have to fix every page. I just fixed one thing and everything ended with a, punctuation mark so yeah. i mean the the father has i mean i look at that as a blessing I, I said it's kind of a game that we play but i look at that as a blessing where the father has taught me how to trust him to trust myself if you will that okay now all the troy is out of it all my opinion all my my wordiness whatever that's all gone it's now what the father wants me to say so he makes sure that every every page on every study you saw the dozens of links that are on that page Every one of them, that every page, if it was something that I wrote. Now, there might be some things on there that I didn't write, but every page ends with a punctuation mark of some sort, not a comma, always an end, a period, exclamation point or question, every page. And that's that was the father's hint to me or nudge to me that, okay, it's done. You're, you did a good job. Move on. And so I, I look at that as a the confirmation, if you will, that the father has you know, been using me to do something. Like I said, I might, might not be the sharpest tool in the drawer, but I am a tool and I don't mind however the, I'm, I'm his tool. He made me so he can use me however he wants. The bad news is he's like, he can also discard me whenever he wants. So I have to be careful about that too. Which is the reason why I don't, I, I, I hesitate to accept any pats on the back or accolades because I feel like the moment I do that, then like you said, pride of opinion comes in or whatever. And you know, then I can't be used. So I, I typically will kind of shrug off all the compliments that I'm given. And I, I, cause I, I look in the mirror every day. I know exactly who I am. I don't feel like I'm any of those nice things you guys said. I appreciate hearing it, but anyway. I saw so, Jonathan walk away. So who's in charge? <laughs> thank you so much, Troy. It's just been such a, just, 
a mind-blowing, eye-opening session today. Just wow. You're very welcome. I, I'm glad that we finally did this. Uh, there's a couple of people that have um, a platform like you have that have been after me to get on the program with them or some sort. And I'll be honest with you, you're the first ones that I've done so with. So well, brother, I don't know if that's, that you decided to join us. Yeah, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. But now that I've done this, I imagine the other guys are going to be lining up saying, OK, you got to get on mine now. <laughs> so uh, we'll see how it goes. You guys, if you're watching this on YouTube, all the contact information will be down at the, in the description for you to just click on to if you're interested in more learning this. We're going to end the recording here. Uh, Troy's given us a lot of his time. We're going to end it here, and then we're probably going to go to a private discussion. I think one of the code searchers wants to show something in the codes to Troy, but we're not going to do that on YouTube, you guys. We're going to save that for Troy, and uh, we're going to say shalom to you all. May you will bless you and keep you. Shalom. Shalom. In the